Hi there. Hopefully, you've already seen my artist feature for Neil Biggin. I'm quite happy with how that came out. It captures both his progression musically and historically. Uh, to make this, I spent quite a while just talking to Neil over email. Usually I'd compile these emails into an easy-to-read article format, but I wanted to try a new, like, radio interview sort of style, so you can hear Neil's story in his own words. He seemed down for this, so he sat down and talked. For nearly four hours. It turns out Neil needed very little grease to get his narrative wheels churning. Uh, I've tried to cut down our chat as much as I can while keeping it coherent, but it's still a lot. As such, I highly recommend watching this video in pieces. Each section is timestamped in the description below, with indicators on screen showing how long each section is, etc. I'm hoping that provides enough information for you to decide when and where is a good resting point, or maybe even starting point, if you want to skip some sections. It's up to you. Having said all that, let's get on with the interview. Hopefully, you'll learn something new and interesting. All right, um, how to start? Let's see. I was going to start basically with the, the very beginning. Okay. So, um, what was your musical upbringing? Like, were your parents musical or what? So our house was a, it was a very musical house, but there were no instruments. So the record player was the center of the house. It was on all the time. The television as well, of course, but my mom had a lot of records. So, and we were always free to play them. They weren't kept away from us because we were children. So we were always spinning seven inches, uh, lots of Motown and Elvis and Elton John and things from the 60s and 70s mainly. But the music was fantastic. I, I loved it. And what was interesting, I was thinking about this today. The first time I had any musical thoughts, I was either seven or eight. Um, I was so obsessed with music. My mum had bought me this really fancy radio for a kid. It was a fancy radio anyway. And I remember listening to this record and listening to the hi-hat pattern and thinking that's really interesting and copying the hi-hat pattern on on the on the bed with my fingers and thinking that's really cool i wonder why they did it like that and then after that song listening to every song's hi-hat pattern and then the bass line and then the you know ev basically breaking down songs as a seven or eight year old that became a real passion in my head i had no musical instrument whatsoever ap apart from a recorder which i never bothered with like a little flute type thing and um but I was breaking down songs all the time. So I'd be making comments to my mom and dad about, or my, or my other brother saying, oh, listen to the bass line on this, or listen to how he's done the hi-hats, or how it fades out, you know, whatever it was. At 8, 9, 10, 11, it just kept growing. So that, that level of interest, I think that I never had a lesson. I never had a musical lesson. I never learned an instrument in, in a traditional way. I wasn't allowed to do music at school because I didn't have instruments at home. So there was no formal education whatsoever. It was just this intense self-education by, by an obsessive listening style, if you like. Yeah, that's like a specific skill, actually. The, the ability to take apart a song and focus on individual elements. That's something I would, I'm surprised you developed that so young. Yeah, and I, I can vividly remember, remember breaking down a song called The Martian Hop, which was like a gimmicky song. Uh, breaking that down, I must have been seven or eight or maybe nine at the latest, and breaking it down into all these little parts in my head and thinking, this is how they do that. And then seeing, you know, seeing, I think I saw a clip of Fleetwood Mac in the studio when I was a, a boy and thinking, okay, each one of those sounds must go on each one of those channels on the mixing desk, you know, and they were moving them up and down. I'm thinking, that's how you do it. And so in a way, it was like an education by just piecing together all the little bits that would come across your brain and your eyes and your ears over that period of time so exciting it was so thrilling but i never even thought that there was a potential for me to get involved with any of that it was just a listening pleasure you know i never learned to read music or write music in a formal sense i learned by by ear but in a when, what's interesting is when you listen to music like that you don't have to copy other people it's already in you you know how to structure a song you know how to layer sounds because you've been obsessing in that way for so many years. Do you know what I mean? It's a, it was a really unusual, I, I, I know no other way, but I don't write bass lines like Peter Hook, but inevitably some of that will come out because I've listened to how his bass lines, where they sit in the mix and how they, how they join, how there's a chorus, a bridge and a, 
and a, a, a verse and then a middle eight and, and the kind of breakdowns, you know. So this was all, once I got an instrument, I got a, a wind organ when I was about 14. You plug it in and, and it plays wind through the, it was an electric wind organ, basically. So it's got a constant spinning uh, fan in the back and it, it feeds air through through every key. So it's a bit like a church organ, but a very primitive little thing for home. But it made a great sound, and it did some great Joy Division esque uh, <laughs> kind of chords. And I remember at that point just sitting down and playing "Decades" by Joy Division. In 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 seconds, I knew how to play it, and I'd never touched a keyboard in my life. I didn't even have a concept of what a key was. All I knew is when I got that keyboard, if I did a run in a certain way, if I ran my fingers up this thing, it was it was polyphonic, like like any organ would be. And when I when I played any I started to notice that these keys were in were they sounded correct if you know what I mean I don't I don't know any other way any other way of putting it consonant I guess say again consonant yeah it was just like this everything it just seemed to work to my ears and then at some point later on I I I remember shunning the idea of learning to read and write music properly because my school has shunned me as a musician they didn't want me to do it because i wasn't a little rich kid with a with a, a piano at home um and the wind organ came just after the uh, entrance for the classes when i was 14 so i anyway um so i couldn't learn and i remember thinking i don't want to learn music i don't want to know what i'm doing because i don't want it to destroy my creativity and i've since read a lot of musicians saying something very similar but what does help is if you know if you know a major key on a keyboard is four 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 keys and then three keys you know four semitones and three semitones when i finally learned that then i knew that i could play major 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 i knew how to form that but i never once used it in an objective deliberate manner i might i might form that major chord shape um but i never and it it just all came kind of naturally it's hard to it's hard to say. So in other words, you weren't thinking like, I'm going to play the major, like the first yeah. major chord here and then uh, the second, which would be, you know, D minor. Yeah. You just knew what, you just knew what shapes you were going to be, you were playing when you were constructing them out of your head. Exactly that. And I tended to form certain shapes with my hands, which in the early years led to repetitive use of chords. In the first one or two years, I would use the same chord shape until somebody mentioned to me a certain somebody played me one jazz chord and i said oh that's really interesting but your fingers are further apart you know as a 15 year old and then so i started to experiment and trying to uh use different chords but always all the same time i was using it on this one sound on this wind organ so i had no versatility and then an uncle um he bought a roland sh09 which is a monophonic synth a fantastic bass machine, but it also plays a beautiful sounding uh, machine. It's heavy, it's metal, it's it's got all the basics there, ADSR, and it's just, just all the basics of synthesizing are, are right there. So I was able to just play around, no manual, just sit and play around like most kids and learn learn that machine backwards. But it was monophonic. There was no, there was no chord, so I'd gone from having one sound and polyphony to having endless sounds and uh, monophonic one key at a time so I was playing bass lines from songs then so then I was playing uh, yeah Joy Division The Cure bass lines and things like that at that point um, and and really getting to grips with sound creation so those two things were really important to me and then a friend at school who was a, a good looking lad he said well I, I don't mind being the singer if you want to get a band together so at 16, I started recording tapes, backing tapes, so that he could sing on top of them and I could play on top of them. It was kind of piecemeal. Everything was done in little pieces. And I created these eight backing tracks and he sang on top of them and I would play lead lines on this monophonic synth. And so everything was then, everything was monophonic. But you were able to, by using multi-tracks, it was only four multi-tracks onto a cassette. So really poor quality. But it was good enough for a live concert in a local church, you know, a local church hall or, or a local civic center or something. So I think we were 16, 17, and we played our first gig 
in this church hall, the band was called Patent Smile. And I think something like 80 kids showed up. We didn't have any records out. We had nothing. We'd stuck pieces of paper up around the village. And something like 80 kids showed up. It was crazy. And they danced to every minute of every song. And we only played eight songs. And, it, and somebody took some fabulous photographs. And overnight, it felt like we were pop stars. And we knew what the hell we were doing. It was, it was the most exciting thing ever. And then I desperately wanted to learn how to write music better and more complicated and have it sound more like a record than it did on our backing tape, you know. I'm thinking, how close are we to New City Stars then? Because this is like um, you're starting basically, you're joining bands. Yeah. You're going on uh, gigs already. So that first gig, I think I was 16, 17, probably 17 that first gig. And quite a way away from New City Stars. So then jumping forward a little bit. So I was in that band um, and then uh, the singer moved away. So we did different things. And then um, Mark Barrett. Um, who was the guy from Future Loop Foundation and, and runs the inter international field record label and stuff. And we were at school together and we became best friends and we're still best friends. So it's been, you know, since we were 15 years old. So he was writing music at the same time as I was writing music and he was writing them for his band and his singer. And he had a bit more money than me. And so he bought better synthesizers. He bought polyphonic synthesizers. I think he bought a Juno. 60 or a 106 or something like that and then i'd borrowed a jupiter 8 sorry a jupiter 6 and i can't looking back now like luckiest 17 18 year old alive for somebody to loan me is jupiter 6 yeah really it was remarkable for somebody that if nobody's ever played one the lights alone are just entrancing this kind of purple color for the synth and then these these red led lights and then the smell of the warm electronics when you plugged it in. And then just every single thing about that machine is still unbelievable. The chord sounds, the, sorry, the string sounds, the synth, synth chords you could create from that thing were just mind blowing. And over, so overnight I was playing things, I couldn't record them, there was no, there was no recording mechanism apart from down to a, a crappy multi-track cassette but I could finally play chords with great synth sounds, which I'd never been able to do. So we're coming up to my 18th birthday. And then uh, mom and dad decided they were going to invest in me. Uh, to, so they bought me a, a Roland, sorry, a Yamaha CX-5N. Do you know that machine? I'm not familiar with it, no. So back in the day, it's, it's a type of computer that came out that nobody ever talks about. They were called MSX. Have you heard of that? Uh, yeah, I think David Wise actually got his start with uh, those as well. Oh, really? I wonder if he did the same thing as me. So basically, Sony made one called a Sony HitBit. It was great because you could learn to program on it. So you could program basic. It was like a Texas Instrument 9 kind of deal. You could really pro program quite simple things. So you could get a type in some typing code from magazines and things like that. But the Yamaha CX-5M was a remarkable piece of kit. It came with a slot for a cartridge. And I think 99% of people who bought this computer bought it for this purpose. Then Yamaha sold a cartridge that you plugged into it that ran uh, an eight track monophonic sequencer. So the sequencer was there and the sound chip was a DX9 sound chip. So you've got this remarkable sounding. I think a DX9 is like a quarter of the power of a DX7. And the DX7 at the time was, was industry standard. It was what Duran Duran used and every, everybody used a DX7. It was on every record in the 80s. And this DX9 basically had very similar, it was FM sound, and it had very similar um, sound qualities to a DX7, but a lot thinner. I think it was four operators. I know this is a bit technical. So you got this capability of making these tremendously interesting bass, bell sounds, full drum sounds, anything you wanted, and you made them from scratch yourself. So this was like having an amazing synth and you had this sequencing. Now, because it was eight note monophonic, you could use, you could use three of those notes to make a chord in exactly the same way as you did with a tracker. So 
all those years later, like seven years later, I come to Gremlin and there's a tracker and I'm writing in exactly the same way with multiple tracks of monophonic notes. Only you could use samples, of course, when, it, when we got to the Amiga tracker. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of technology kind of overlaps like that. It's kind of interesting how that happens. Yeah, it's mind blowing how long it hangs around for and how it kind of morphs from one thing to another as well. It's not like the phones where there's a massive jump every so often. With music, things like a, a Jupiter 6 is still used on records every day today. I mean, you can't beat it. Exactly, there it is. And the DX7, I'm sure, is still used, but it's a, it's a dated sound now. Yeah. So going back to the CX-5M, so at the time, I didn't have a singer, and Mark Barrett didn't have a singer. So I said to him, why don't we get together? And he said, well, I'm not singing. So I said, well, I'll sing then. So what we did was we, we booked a few gigs and we chained together. You could MIDI together the two MSX computers. Now, this was really, really primitive days of MIDI and primitive days of computing, really. We're talking about uh, probably the first time we did this, I was 19 or 20. So 1987, 86, 87. Oh, yeah, that's before MIDI was even standardized. So really early days. I can't remember the exact year, to be honest. I, I think I was probably 19, 18, 19. So, yeah, maybe 86, 87 by the time. So we're linking these two together and we're playing live gigs. Now, the MSX, you had a cartridge in there, but you had to load songs from cassette. So what we would do is we'd load up one, one MSX with a song and press play while the other one was loading up from a cassette. And then when one song finished on one machine, we'd play on the other machine. And so the two of us were standing there with synths, synths in front of us, as well as loading up at the same time. So it was a very, we wanted to do this, we considered this real, as opposed to Depeche Mode's early work, which is on backing tape. We desperately didn't want to do backing tapes ever again. So we considered it to be live and real, as long as the computer was playing it, and we were playing on top of it, that was real. That's what I was just thinking, because... Um... Even today, a lot of uh, electronic producers, they feel like they just get up on the stage and push the play button. But you're doing so much shuffling up there. You're not even really, you can't even say that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure everybody's different. So I've, I watched, um, you know, I remember going to see Banco de Gaia and thinking, look how many synths he's got, how many, how many sequences he appears to have. He had so much kit. And I know for a fact he was using it all live and he was moving from one, one setup to another setup. And it's what made him feel good. It's what, what worked for him live in front of an audience. Because if you're just pressing play and then pretending to move your, your twiddle your knobs like a DJ does, then where's the thrill in that? But it, what it also did was it gave you this edge of fear that you stood in front of an audience. I think we played a gig in Matlock to 100 nurses or something. Um, Matlock in Derbyshire in England. And um, this is me and Mark Barrett again. And we were terrified of if one song didn't load from cassette. And cassette was such a, an inexact science at that time. Loading a song was, or loading a game from cassette was so hit and miss. So you're live on stage loading from cassette. It was absolutely terrifying. And we had no backup. We had no backing tape. We had nothing else to fall back on. And we were always terrified of, of that happening, of something going wrong. But it used to go wrong in rehearsals constantly, but it never let us down live. Oh, that's lucky. It's so lucky. So chaining these two things together became, um, it felt like you were flying by the seat of your pants the whole time. So exciting. And then uh, we went and bought a, a Mirage, which is basically the very first affordable sampler that was a keyboard at the same time. And I, I remember going, I remember we got it home, plugged it in and put a microphone in the back. And, uh, but yeah, I think you had to put, yeah, I think it was using uh, little floppy disks, little three, three inch floppy disks. I put a floppy disk in and we didn't know we were, we were recording. And I just said to Mark, go on, go for it. And he hit a key and it's me going, go for it, go for it. And our very first sample was me saying, go for it. And, uh, we, <laughs> we used it in songs and all sorts. And then we just sat down and went, oh my God, we can do anything. We can sample anything in the world. We, we got your voice. We just need to make sure something's in tune. We can sample anything in the world. So 
we didn't have any other synths to sample, so we were then making or using organic sounds. So basically, foley and just hitting things, and then um, we started building songs like that. And then we did get other synths. Mark got synths. I borrowed synths and and things like that. And then we started to have a really nice sound. Very still very primitive. And this is in about 1980, yeah, 88, 89 by this point, I think, the Mirage. So now we're, we're sampling. We can't, you know, it's become so advanced from having a wind organ to having a sampler in just a few years and having sequencing capabilities. And then um, Mark at the same time had been playing with the Commodore and playing, trying to, the Commodore 64, and he'd been doing some sequencing from the 64, I think. And then, of course, he bought the MSX as well. So we were both writing songs on these MSX trackers, basically. It, it was so fantastic. So then we started to look for a singer. And we auditioned a bunch of singers in Sheffield. And bear in mind, you're competing with other bands at this point. So Sheffield, that time, had so many unsigned bands that were terrific. Like Pulp were unsigned. And the Human League was signed. But there were band, lots of bands like Pulp and Treebound Story. And there were just so many cool bands that were just getting ready to, to, to get signed. And they were all looking for a keyboard player or a singer or, you know, whatever. So me and Mark were constantly being headhunted. Do you want to play keyboard for us? Do you want to sing for us? That kind of thing happened. So we'd each play in different bands all the time, but we were still, you know, working on stuff together. Um, but there was this place in the center. I'm from Sheffield in the north of England. There was this there was this theater called the Crucible Theater, which is where the World Snooker Championships is held. And on a Saturday lunchtime, it became, um, and some, for some reason, this unspoken meeting place for all the musicians in Sheffield. And I remember seeing someone from almost every single band there, apart from Def Leppard, like all the Sheffield bands at the time, apart from Def Leppard. I never saw, never saw them there. But you'd see, you know, I remember seeing the keyboard player from Pulp there and keyboard player from the human league was in there we were all everybody was in there and so i got we used to just move around from band to band while we were in that at lunchtime somebody would literally walk up to you and say do you want to play this gig we've got a gig on the 21st you know so it was all growing like this and sheffield was this absolute mecca of electronic music so if you didn't have a sampler you had a jupiter 6 or you had an sh09 or if you didn't have a sequencer you you got the guy who had a sequencer to join your band that's a um... That's way more hectic and like involved than I thought or what I expected. Yeah, it was, it was basically, and also what that meant was, if you found if there was a keyboard player in a certain shop or a company, his friend might buy a keyboard or a guitar because they worked together, just like the Joy Division story, I guess, and loads of bands got together this way. But what was interesting was, certain shops ended up with a bunch of musicians coming out of them because one guy did it and another guy did it and they go to the crucible for lunch. So you've got this strange situation of um, bands being created from, from shops and shop assistants because they all went there for lunch. And if you heard somebody needed a singer, you might give it a go. Totally crazy. Kind of a small world in a way. And you know, for a city of half a million, it was the, I think it's the fourth biggest city in England. In it's got the tiniest, um, musical community and everybody knew everybody and everybody was joining everybody else's bands so I remember joining a band called Ice Parade and being their keyboard player and I never wrote a note They all the songs were already written which was unusual so you got all these different things you were learning and then we had a practice room so the first time you'd ever seen a practice room was really interesting sharing it with other bands and you got in there and there were some congas there you were learning other instruments as well learning different rhythms and then me and Mark Barrett start looking for singers. And this guy applies to be our, our singer. And he's very tall. And he's a brilliant keyboard player. And we're like, oh, we don't want another keyboard player. There's two of us already. We want somebody that can sing better than me. Because I'm an okay singer. But I, I didn't really feel like I was a rock and roll singer. I didn't really feel like I looked the part. And I, my voice wasn't that great. It was okay, but not great. So we, we interviewed this guy. Like, he must be 6'2 to 6'4" with a beautiful angelic voice and an amazing, uh, amazing pianist, a keyboard player. And he was fantastic with the, um, with the mod wheel and the, the uh, I forgot what it's called, the other wheel. He was amazing with the two wheels on a synthesizer anyway. 
So he was using the pitch bend as though it was a fork. He was just a genius with this pitch bend. And he would match his voice to the pitch bend in the song. And he wrote these beautiful songs. Anyway, he sang a few gigs with us, but it didn't really work out. And he's, his name is Elliot Kennedy. And he, he wrote songs for Brian Adams, the Spice Girls, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. He won a Grammy. He won, he, you know, he's, he's a multimillionaire songwriter. He's just a fantastic guy and a really down-to-earth guy. But he became massively successful on his own. So this is somebody else that kind of came through. We were, we were together as a band for maybe six months. And then, um, and then we went our own different ways kind of thing. He was too good of a songwriter to stay singing our songs. His songs are better than our songs, um, basically. Um, he was more advanced. He was about two years ahead of us in terms of songwriting and lyrics and, and being poppy and being saleable. And his stuff was very much more commercial than ours. And we were trying to be cool kids. We were, we were into, you know, um, techno and uh, dark indie stuff. And we wanted to be cool. We didn't want to be commercial. And he was clearly commercial. And that's why he's become a massive success. Um, he said, I think he's the only person to have a number one hit. He's had a number one hit as a writer in more decades than any other writer in, in history, I think. Um, in England, that is. So anyway, he's a fantastic guy. We're still friends. Um, so that happened. And then me and Mark decided we'd, we'd try and do other music. So we did some techno kind of stuff. And then techno was developing and pop music was developing to include some techno. And all of a sudden you've got Acid House started the summer of love, 1988. Um, so I was 21 years old then. So all of a sudden you've got that filter. <laughs> This kind of sound started happening. This filtered and much good stuff. Yeah, this modulated, beautiful tweaking of synths happened in in songs. All of a sudden, Detroit happened. Detroit had techno. Sheffield had techno, and DJs would go from one city to the other. And so you got you go to a Sheffield nightclub, and you'd hear all this Detroit house, really early Detroit house, and it really early, really cool rap that you wouldn't hear anywhere else, hip-hop that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. And you'd also got Cabaret Voltaire in Sheffield that had been on the cutting edge of that stuff since before anybody else. The Human League had become a pop band by that time, but Cabaret Voltaire was still creating really interesting stuff in Sheffield. So we got all these local influences, but we'd also got the influence of Detroit and the things we were hearing every night in a nightclub. And so we went out and bought a TB303, a bass line, which is a, basically, it's the Acid House bass machine. And it was the sense to have, yeah. It really was, and there it was. And we also got copies of them, and then we started buying things like uh, reverb machines and th things like this to make it sound more realistic and sound like uh, more like a real band and better than that. But now we got some equipment ourselves, which enabled us to record demos of a much better quality. But we hadn't, we hadn't got a singer and we hadn't got a direction. And then I started working with this, this couple, uh, Sean and Eleanor Phillips, and they were both beautiful looking. They both got great voices. They were funny. They had great personality, very charismatic. And so I asked them if they wanted to sing, and they didn't just want to sing. They wrote lyrics. And they were commercial, and they added a commercial sound to our kind of uh, darker techno. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask about because uh, the the demo you sent me, um, just a feeling. I, I forgot the title off the top of my head. Uh, the state of mind. State of mind. Yeah. Um, Pure pop. Yeah, that's very pop. Not. Uh, I don't really yeah. hear the techno influences, despite what you were leading up to there. Exactly. So what happened in the in the space of about a year, we became we went from being that techno. Um, 303 sound um doing really what would you what, how would you describe it like techno chill out to all of a sudden we've got two clearly they're pop singers so it'd be a massive waste to not use them as pop singers so we started writing more commercial music but still with synthesizers and the thing the main thing that came out of that was a two-track demo one of which is state of mind which you included on on the video 
and we we loved their voices we loved everything about this their look they're both extremely good looking uh they're both models and blah 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 so this seemed like a match made in heaven i could play keyboards mark could play keyboards we wrote half he'd write songs hyde write songs we both write the lyrics you know it was just a really great band to be in but we only managed to play one gig we played at sheffield university and we played this gig it was packed out i don't think they charged on the door so everybody came in um it was very it was a very good gig and um but pure pop we did a cover we rarely did covers but we did a cover of celebrate by cool and the gang it doesn't get more pop than that and by this point i think i'm coming up to being 25 years old and um i wasn't quite happy with how this was going i was happy with the band but i wasn't happy with the music because it didn't it wasn't new order it wasn't Bauhaus. it wasn't it wasn't cool you know so i wanted to do something uh cooler but they were all really happy with the direction it was going and they wanted to make money so this was and i was against it i don't know why i was against making money out of music it's so stupid now when i think back it'll be selling out right yeah that's what it was and you know as a teenager that's the very last thing you want to do isn't it exactly as a teenage musician the last thing on earth you want to do is sell out and you admire those musicians that don't sell out so we wanted to be we wanted to make money but not not by selling out you got a radio one appearance i believe you told me with your uh, um with, with your the band. band yeah so what happened was we'd we'd created these two songs we recorded them in mark's apartment that he didn't have a studio it was just like any any boy's studio with a bunch of synths and effects and all this stuff so we recorded all the the music there um at that point mark had got a really nice setup at home my setup was still fairly primitive i just had this one great w roland w30 um but mark had got a really nice setup with multiple synths and effects and things like that all outboard effects and nice speakers so his was the obvious place to record but recording this music was as simple as pressing play on the synth on the sequencer and then making sure you got a good recording of each line, you know. But then recording the vocals was really interesting. Of course, we're in somebody's apartment. So I created this, uh, I created a vocal booth by hanging. In, in England, you have lights that hang from the ceiling on a cable. I don't know what it's like everywhere else in the world. But you had these lights that came down and then a circular lampshade that would hang off it. So what I did was I put a heavy sweater on four coat hangers and hung the coat hanger around the cable and dangled the sweater off the edge. So we basically, you, you got a square of sweaters and put the microphone in the middle of it and you bent down and you stood up and your head was completely surrounded by heavy sweaters, which made for absolutely a perfect vocal booth. And so we took, that was in one room. We took the cable into the other room. There were headphones and so you, as a monitor and then you just sang in there. I think the lead singer sang five five times and I sang five times. So it sounds really fat because you've got loads of backing vocals. We multi-tracked. We read that Duran Duran had multi-tracked, I think it was 200 times or something, the myth goes, on Wild Boys to get that Wild Boys, Boys that big crowd sound. Uh, I remember when I was um, working with your song, trying to get it in my mix, I was trying to like remaster it a little bit. And when I was doing that, I noticed there was a lot of layers of vocals that weren't obvious when on first listen so yeah that's yeah. true and so i think her voice was really strong and cut through it's a different makeup to a man's voice so i think we might have done two of her and ten of us but so this whole recording process literally took one day and so we sent this song off radio one in england which is the radio channel in england it always will be always has been um it's faint where john peel is is from and Right. It's where so many bands got their start. Everybody from Led Zeppelin to Cliff Richard. And, you know, that's where you played first in England. So the biggest show in England on that channel is the drive time show between, I think it's between four and six in the evening. And at five to, at five, to five on the drive home every night of the week, he would do, it's called Steve Wright in the Afternoon. Steve Wright in the Afternoon. Music. Radio and he would do this unsigned band thing so he wanted to hear from the best bands in england that weren't yet signed and try and try and launch their careers 
So we sent ours off and I fully expected it not to get played. And it was played within a week. Couldn't believe it. So we're all tuning in every day. And then we got a call one day saying, you're going to be on this afternoon. We couldn't believe it. So there it was. We played to, I don't know how many millions. It was the biggest show ever at the time. And it was so exciting. We didn't get any interest whatsoever from any record labels. We were gutted, absolutely gutted. And then you broke up. And then we broke up almost immediately. But what happened was, and I can't remember the chronology perfectly, but what happened was um, this was played on the radio. I got the job offer from Gremlin. And I didn't know, but behind my back, the rest of the guys were talking to record companies um, through other people that they knew. So Mark Barrett knew some other people. So he'd been to London to discuss a record, a record deal without me. So we weren't friends for about two or three years. And then this happens all the time in music, right? Yeah, but I can also it also kind of makes sense from what you were saying, because it sounded like... Um... Everybody else wanted to go a different direction. That's it. So it's like, let's, let's go ahead and get the pop thing while he's not looking. Exactly. It's that musical differences thing, right? It's the classic thing. Yeah. But I think that's a good read on it. All right. Some, something else I wanted to ask was, um, what was your, like, how much gaming did you do at home? Because uh, apparently you were playing Zool before you got into Gremlin. Yeah. Well, my little brother was, um, he's 10, 10 years younger than me. So we used to play games together. We weren't huge gamers, but me and both of my brothers, we, all three of us, we had an Atari. So we we played we played a lot of games, but we'd not been you wouldn't call us gamers. We weren't into gamers games. So we'd play things like football manager type games, or we'd play Qbert on the Atari or Missile Command. But we'd play these things for hours and hours and hours together. And when we got the MSX computers, we started buying more interesting games. And playing on the PC, we started playing Leisure Suit Larry and things like that. Um, but we weren't serious gamers. But when we got an Amiga in the house, um, the Amiga games, I used to, I used to buy Amiga demo, demos from a guy. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Like people would make, in the very early days of the Amiga, they would make spinning globes and do 3D video. Oh yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Remember that? It was great. and Somebody would put great music to it. Um, and it was a time of games like Gods and Turrican 2 and pay, uh, Speedball and things like that. Um, really cool Amiga games. And this same guy, we didn't have a lot of money um, from a working class background. And this, uh, this guy I knew used to get pirated games at the time. So you go around to his house, you give him 10, 10 pounds and he'd give you 50 discs full of full of Amiga games and Amiga demos. Yeah, that's a common story too. It's pretty fun. Is it? Yeah. Ah, that's good to know. Uh, you've got no idea what else is going on. And I used to buy blank discs from this guy. I wish I could remember his name. And he later, this shows you what a small world it is, he later became the drummer for the Human League. I think he still is. Huh. Um, so we were all, everybody was connected, the video game and the music world. It was all kind of connected. Um, so, but Zool, I'd actually bought the official copy of, uh, for my brother for Christmas. It was a great, a great, uh, platform game. We never, we never want, we weren't interested in, it seemed English, like Zool seemed like an English game, whereas Sonic seemed American and big and flash. And to a Northern English person, the sensibilities of Zool and how down to earth it seemed to be just suited us. Whereas Sonic just seemed a bit too... Larry, a bit too big, a bit too polished. I'd say that's an accurate read. Yeah, for like for our sensibilities, I suppose. And so we were buying a lot of English games and getting pirated games as well at the time, of course. And it's how lots of my coding friends were also getting pirated games. I'm sure they were pirating them as well, and they were hacking in the code and learning how to code that way. And so we were doing the same thing. So me and my brother Paul were breaking into. Uh, football manager games and changing the names to be our favorite players or our own names um, and just and changing the stats of certain players to be better to be better you know just basic hacking that you could really do with early games you know yeah. you can't do it anymore so simply but back then it was so easy so yeah it was a house where video games were definitely a thing but none of us you could never call any of us hardcore gamers to this day all right, we spent enough time uh, talking about before Gremlin. Uh, 
let's move on to getting into Gremlin. Uh, at that particular point, I was at work. I had an office job working for the government. And um, I saw an advert in the newspaper saying musicians wanted for a video game company. And the video game company was Gremlin Graphics, who became Gremlin Interactive. Um, and this tiny little advert said, um, write to us for further information. I, I thought, well, this sounds really interesting. And I, I thought, what do I have to do? So I contacted them. They sent me a letter and the letter said, I, thought, I can't remember if it was four or five tracks, but. It was four. Yeah, it was four. OK, we would like you to write a soundtrack, one song for each of these types of games. So I think there was an adventure game, uh, a platform game, a soccer game. I uh, can't remember what the other one was. Shoot 'em ups hadn't been invented by them. I think it was a racing game. Racing game, that's right. Uh, I, love, I love how you have better memory of this than me. And so I was in a, a job doing IT support, and I thought, oh my god, I I'll do anything to get this job as a as a write. You know, so I can be writing music all day every day. So I just went to my boss immediately and showed him the advert. I said, I need to take next week off. So he said, yeah, no problem at all. They knew I was, I never stopped playing the music at work. So, you know, they knew what I wanted to be. So I, I took the week off and I just bought a Roland W30, um, I think a few months before that. And a W30 workstation, it's a, it's a, it's a sampler, but it's also a sequencer inside it. And then uh, you've, got a, you've got a floppy disk area to load sounds and load songs on so you could it was much more versatile than the mirage much more versatile than the msx cx5m that i described earlier so you've got this fantastic polyphonic sequencer inside a keyboard that was also a sampler that also came with loads of discs and you could buy more discs with all these fantastic sounds synth sounds and of course you could sample synthesizers so i borrow synths and sample them and all this stuff so I've been learning how to write on this for ages, and I, I was efficient. I was I was ready to go. So I literally spent I think it was probably nine days, like a, a weekend, the five days in the middle, and the next weekend, nine days writing these four songs from start to finish. And I sent uh, sent away a cassette. I think it must have been. Or I don't know if I burnt a CD. I might have, might have paid to burn a CD, which was twenty five pounds at the time to burn a CD. And I sent it off, and there were two hundred and fifty applicants. And they told me when I went for the interview that they were, they were, it was between me and this, and someone from the orchestra, I believe. Um, it was somebody who played cello and things like that. But I'd written four songs that were basically, they fit all their games, you know, they, they fit straight away. It was no hard work to drop these songs into a song, into a game immediately. So they didn't have to teach somebody how to use the software. They by hiring me, I think it was an easier hire than hiring somebody who's a, an orchestral musician and then teaching them how to use the software and how to program and all that stuff. So I think I got it based on that between me and her. I'm not certain, but I think that's it. Pat Pat Phelan was was the the guy that interviewed me and James North Hearn. So basically, Pat Patrick Phelan had had been the games musician at Gremlin for years and years. And he just had a promotion up to be head of creative. So he still did a bit of music, but he wanted someone to do his job now. So I sat and he interviewed me and I'd bought my brother a copy of Zool that Christmas. And he'd done the music for Zool. So I'm like, no way. Guess what? <laughs> I'm talking to my family and saying, I met the guy that did the music for Zool. And then my very first job on the first day at Gremlin, they sat me on the corner of a desk with an Amiga 500 and a crappy old monitor and said, we're doing, we're doing Zool 2, off you go. And so that next Christmas, I gave my brother Drew a copy of Zool 2 with my name on it and my songs on it. And I think um, some of those samples were from samples that I'd, I'd created before on the W30, but it had to be used on the tracker. You couldn't, I couldn't, tran I couldn't uh, convert the sequences from the W30. So yeah, that takes us to that. So when I arrived at Gremlin and on my first day, I was astounded to walk into the different offices. I'm, I'll paint a picture of, of, of Gremlin. And the day I joined, I believe there was 51 of us. Um, the day I joined, they, they, it was in an old building called the Little Mesters. 
which in Sheffield used to be a place where they made forks and knives. Sheffield's famous for cutlery and stainless steel. So this, there was lots and lots of little offices that used to be little workrooms, and each one had a built had a, a walled over fireplace where these guys would build a fire and sit tapping metal all day, all night. So every tiny little office had now got a coder in it, or two coders, or a coder and an artist. And mine was at the top floor, because I'm a musician, mine was at the top floor at the far end, as far away from anybody else as you could possibly be, so I could have my music at good volume and not irritate anybody else. And on the same floor as me was the Top Gear team, and um, the loaded team, um, the premier manager team, the the um, jungle strike and desert strike teams, the little devil team, all these people were on my floor, and you ended up becoming best friends with the people who you work next to. Of course, you'd hang out, you know, you'd share stories and gossip and stuff. So I learned so much about those people. Well, what was interesting to me, I felt so intimidated by their knowledge of games which was huge compared to mine. And there was a, sto- a stock room there, which was raided every day by everybody in the company, just full of Gremlins games. You would have loved it. <laughs> this place was incredible. It was the size of a large bathroom. Imagine a millionaire's bathroom. It was that big. And it was ceiling to, <laughs> ceiling to floor, boxes of games from uh, Commodore 64 to Amiga. And then, of course, later on, playstation it was t-shirts it was everything you could imagine but on top of that you'd also got badges and um, freebies and things that were given away t-shirts and hats and god knows what but then because of zool zool was sponsored by chupa chops chupa chops are lollipops um i believe that design was designed by picasso as well chupa chops anyway it was yeah 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 quick note from the future it was not picasso it was Salvador Dali. Picasso actually was alive at the time, but did not do this. Okay, back to the interview. So we got literally hundreds and hundreds of Chupa Chups lollipops in this in this stock room. And every day you could see people walking all over Gremlin eating Chupa Chups for years until these things were the last one was finally stolen from the from the stock room, you know. It was such a really it was such a fun time. But there were games in there that I'd seen in magazines that I had no idea were gremlins, like Hero Quest and um, old driving games and Monty the Mole and all, the, all these things that I'd, never, I'd seen pictures of, but I'd never played. I wasn't a Commodore 64 guy. Um, so I didn't know the history and I didn't know who these people were. And then getting to know them all, you find out this guy did the original Top Gear. This guy wrote the music for this. And, you know, you've got, you found out I was working with fantastic coders um, who'd worked on some of the most important games, and they were there right at the very beginning of Commodore 64. Just legends, some of them. And uh, I felt like I was really intimidated. You walk into one of their offices, and there were wall-to-wall posters of games, either that they'd worked on or games that they loved, or it became increasingly they became increasingly covered with things like Gillian Anderson pictures or things like that from, from X-Files when that happened. Um, but basically this obsession they all had with games and we'd finished for lunch at 12.30 and come back to work at 1.30. Between 12.30 and 1.30, everybody was playing games. So you weren't just making games, you were then playing games immediately. And these guys went home and played games all night. I never did that. I never played games at night. Once I lived at, worked at Gremlin, I got married. I went home and I hung out with my wife and I did wifely things. I was never interested in taking my work home. I carried on writing music at home sometimes, but not very often. But I wasn't playing games. But these guys were buying the rare machines and rare games that they were importing from Japan. And at lunchtime, we'd play games like Super Bomberman. You'd have a room full of us all playing Bomberman and uh, things like that. It was an amazing time to be alive. And I vividly remember the first day. um, We used to play Warlords 2, me and Pat. I don't know if you remember that. It was a PC game. It's a fantastic uh, early real-time strategy game. I think it was turn-based. You're moving your armies from here to there. It's a brilliant game, even now. I don't remember that one. It's a great game. Watch a little two-minute video on it. It's a really cool game. And um, they still use the the ideas from that today. Uh, You can still see so many of the ideas from that today. So we used to play that. And then 
out of nowhere, Doom 2, ar- Doom 2 arrived and the internet arrived and then a local area network arrived, a LAN arrived and all of a sudden, every one of these bedrooms turned into offices are all connected. And right then, we got this game called Doom 2 and we could play hide and seek with guns on our computers against each other, all the same floor. So we're shooting each other, hiding from each other and shouting insults and swearing at each other all up and down the corridors for an hour every single lunchtime. It was a doom fest. Just absolute madness. Yeah, I heard that was like an epidemic when Doom was released with multiplayer and offices. Yeah, productivity just dropped everywhere is what I hear anyway. Yeah, it would have. It didn't in our place because we had to make our own games and we wanted to get back to work. I don't think there was a lot of productivity lost because we wanted to get back to work, but my God, every second of every lunch hour was, was taken up by Doom 2. And then at that point, for me, other games started to be an influence. I never copied anybody else. I never was influenced like by a particular composer. But then I started listening to the sounds and thinking, this is really interesting how they've done that. I wonder, I wonder I should be upping my game. I should be getting better at sound effects and then getting better at speech. So it was an, it was an important time. You have to go back a little bit. Um, your first days at uh, Gremlin, it sounds to me like you basically sat down next to Pat and were like, being shown, here's how you work the Amiga. Let's make some tunes. Exactly that, yeah. They, there was the room full of all the nuts and bolts and the half finished, the, the half uh, built uh, snares and whatever, all the machines that were out at the time. The room where they were all in pieces had a desk on it with a little room on the corner. And that was the only space they had for me. So literally, I wasn't even sat correctly at the desk. I was on the corner of it. And um, so you could put one leg either side of this. I'll never forget it. One leg either side of this pole that was holding up the desk. And then they brought me this grotty looking old Amiga A500. And he said, this is how you're going to write music. I'm like, what? How can you write on this? Where's the keyboard plug in? No, you don't. You just press the A, D, S, F, R. What? So I have to press this to make the song. He said, yeah, but you're not going to be playing chords in the same way. This is sample based. So you'd be doing monophonic sequencing using samples, which means you could have a sample of a chord. You press the letter S. And that chord plays in this way. You press the D and it plays it in a different way. So it was just like a sampler, but inside, inside the Amiga. So I immediately went to the station, stationers, WH Smiths in England, and bought little black and white stickers and put them on the keys so I knew where, where I was. And it immediately, day one, there I am with, it was called Pro Tracker, I think. I think mine was called Pro, yeah, that's it. Pro Tracker or Subtracker. I can't remember which. Pro Tracker, I think. We didn't use the one that everybody else used. We used a slightly different one, which is better. Anyway, um, Pat sat with me and taught me how to use it. And not only that, he taught me some clever tricks. For a while, he had to teach me all the clever tricks. I wasn't learning any of my own. It takes a while to get to know things. But I remember the first thing he taught me was how to do an echo and a delay. There's no, there's no special effects built into an Amiga A500. So you had to you had to generate these things yourself. So an echo would be done quite simply by playing a sound and then playing it quieter a few beats later. Now that becomes really interesting if you want something that's arpeggiating and echoing in the gaps because you might play a note, then an echo of it, then another note, then another echo of the one two notes ago. So it gets quite messy to look at and very intricate to compose, but it has this fantastic effect. And also, because each one of these tracks is monophonic, it has a natural gate, uh, which is a technical word for cuts off the sample. So when, it, when another sound plays, it cuts, off, it cuts off the last one if it's in that channel. So a bass note can't go bing with a long fade out like that, or it can't naturally reverb or resonate or sustain. It has to cut off. So it'll go bing, 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 which gives which gives the Amiga its own fingerprint in, it, in its kind of sound creation. And when you're listening to an Amiga song, you know that it's been made on a monophonic tracker in that way. Amiga really does sound like nothing else. 
I like how you call that a gate as if it's a feature and not like a shortcoming of the hardware. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's how you had, there you go, it's the optimism for it. And the and the reverb was much, done much the same way as an echo. It was like a less lesser echo, it was just slightly quieter. Um so you could make if you had enough space in your song, then you, you could you could create these echoes and, and reverbs and make it sound like a real song in effect because you're using uh, sampled chords, sampled vocals. It was really down to your ingenuity and your craft and your skill. And I really adapted really quickly to that machine, I must say. I, I, I'm really proud of those first Zool songs. I'll never forget. I think Pat said it to me and I said it afterwards. I was competing against every kid in every bedroom that had been writing songs for Amiga on, for those demo discs that we just talked about for a start. Kids had been writing music and using these trackers and samplers for years. And I'd never, I'd never seen it before. So day one of this job, I'm competing. My song has, is going to be reviewed in a magazine a few months later. And, by, and it's going to be listened to by kids who've been using this, this technology for a lot longer than me. I don't know how many years, but several. So that was really intimidating. But I knew that you, if a sample's clean, you can't beat a clean sample. They couldn't beat me on my sample. So I, and I knew that if I got this echo and, and reverb kind of system down, they couldn't beat me on that. So really the only way I could be inferior and not sound like a pro is if my compositions were weak. So that's where I spent my time on my compositions on, and on original sampling. So uh, innovative use of little vocal samples and cartoon samples and things like that. So that's how I did, that's how I tried to compete. We had a nice little sampler, which probably everybody else had that plugged into the back of the machine. Just a tiny little box that looked like a disk drive, but it did really nice clean samples. And we, I think I borrowed the Jupiter 6 at the time. So we had, um, I think, I think Pat had a Juno 60 or a 106. So we had great sound sources. And then we also had, we started buying sample CDs and uh, more and more sample CDs. I remember I bought a massive Hanna-Barbera collection and started using those samples. The, qual the sample quality of the Amiga was, was very good, but not, nothing like today's sample quality. So it has, a, it has a sound because the samples are crushed a bit. So the sound of drum samples, especially the high end, uh, the snare drums and the hi-hats, they have this crushed quality, which I really like. I have a fondness for. So when, you, when anybody listens to old Amiga songs, you have to bear in mind that the, that the snare drums and the hi-hats and anything at that end of the spectrum sounds a bit crushed and distorted. But I, I think it's a, it's a feature, <laughs> you know, if you're putting it that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something you mentioned in that was... Um... You would read the reviews in magazines. I was wondering how much do you actually pay attention to those? Because it seems like some composers like keep an eye out, got to read every review, and some don't even want to know. I, I had a love-hate relationship with with the reviews, and that's probably the same for every musician. But yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you love the good ones, you hate the bad ones. But it wasn't like that. It was um, where they weren't technically reviewed properly. I remember. When, when the PSX first came, I, to cut a long story short, I used to read everything I could find. The marketing department and sales department in Gremlin was fantastic. Those people were brilliant. I loved them. They were great. They made Gremlin what it was. The games were good, but the marketing and sales team were geniuses. So those games went out with every... Like we had Loaded was released with the PlayStation in America. It was sold as a package with the PlayStation. And it little English company sold that game it was sold so i think we sold 150,000 copies with the ps1 that's how good that team was but they also used to get in every single copy of every single games magazine known to man from all over the place all over the world so i used to go down there constantly and read my own press <laughs> loved it and, but there were so many downers and little devil was a playstation one title with the with the introduction of the playstation You'd got CDs, which CDs, of course, meant you'd got more space than you had on a little disc or on a cartridge. And it also meant you could have real audio, like a real CD audio. So you could put a CD in from a PlayStation, it would play music, but it would also play with this loud buzzing noise at the beginning. But sound effects were still stored in memory, so they were still loaded. 
instead of being loaded as an audio file, they were loaded by the coders into memory so they they could then be fired whenever they whenever they were prompted by gameplay. So you've got this character, this devil character in Little Devil. And so I would create a footstep sound or three footstep sounds or five, and they would randomly play each footstep sound so we'd got some variety on his footsteps. And Pat also created a bunch of great sound effects for that game. Now, normally in a video game, you might have 20, 30, 40 sound effects in a whole game for some of the early games like the SNES, uh, the Super Nintendo, sorry, the the um, the Mega Drive, the Sega Genesis, whatever you want to call them, the, the Amiga. You wouldn't have a lot of sound effects because there just wasn't room for them as well as all the, the levels and the, the art. So they were very restricted. 50 was a huge number of sound effects. Little Devil on the PlayStation 1, I believe the number was 254. And I was so excited and so proud of this. And it was so varied. Walking around, things made noises everywhere. It was just, and it would, there was variety. Instead of just having one footstep sound, you could have four and randomly choose between them to make it sound realistic instead of the same identical plod, which sounds like a bass drum. So this was so exciting to me. And I'll never forget the first review came in. And the reviewer clearly knew nothing about audio. And he said, the sound effects are fantastic in this game, which made me feel good. There must be at least 30 of them. And I'm like, what? You're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot. No, he's, he's right. He's right. There's, it, there's <laughs> at least 30 of them, no less. He's absolutely. He was factually correct. Like 254. You just wanted to get them by the throat. Or you wanted to educate all of them. And every once in a while, well, quite often, actually, um, journalists from games would come would come to the office and, and meet, meet me and do an interview and, and take photographs and stuff. And I would take, be at painstaking lengths to educate every one of them on the music creation, the limitations, the difficulties of writing music for the Super Nintendo, how many sound effects were in each game, how they were created, you know, the fact that I was writing music, writing speech, recording speech, make, use, making sound effects using Foley, you know, all these things and try and let them know what was involved when they're listening to a game and they take the sound for granted. There's a huge amount of work goes into to every game, no matter how simple it is. The sad thing is I can't find any of those interviews. Oh, man. Uh, so I've got some on. I've got some somewhere. I'll try and send them to you. Um, I'd love to see them. Yeah, I've got some. And every once in a while, a real music magazine would come in for an interview. So I remember, uh, I think it was just called... It was a record mirror, I think, in England. They had James Brown on the cover, and they had an interview with me inside. So I got a copy of that. Um, and real specialist uh, music magazines. I think I was in Studio Sound or whatever it was called. So that was, that was great for me. I like being in games magazines, but being in real music magazines was fantastic. And there was a free newspaper given away by music stores. And so all real musicians went into buy a bass or and couldn't afford it, but picked up the free magazine. I was I was interviewed in there, a nice full pager in there. So lots of things to show my mom and my brothers, which and my dad. So I was really proud, you know. Those magazines were they they were things you could show to everybody else and say, Hey look, I'm in a magazine. Oh, that was great. Like the next thing I wanted to touch on was um you've been working with the Amiga on uh on your first week. And then it seems like not too long after that, you were just like, here's the CD32. We want a Red Book version of Azul soundtrack. Make it as fast as possible. Like, what happened there? Yeah, so the guy that... I, I'd never heard the term Red Book before. And the guy that ran... He was the manager of the company called James North Hearn. Uh, he came into my office and he said, we're going to need a load of Red Book tracks for this, for this new machine. It's an Amiga with a CD on the side of it. I remember him saying to me at the time, we don't think it's going to sell... We don't think the machine's going to sell. We're not sure how many of the game's going to sell, but we've got a deal with sales and marketing where we're going to launch Zool in the same week, I think it was, as the, as the CD32, the Amiga CD32 is launched. So in other words, it was, it was roughly the same code. I think it needed a bit of adapting, but it was roughly the same code as the Amiga version of, this, of Zool because there'd been no time to create something specific that took advantage of the technology. Yeah, I think all that took advantage was like they added some cutscenes and some uh, Red Book music, and I think that's all they changed. And because literally there was no development time whatsoever. So that makes perfect sense. Adding great, 
it was called Gremlin Digital Video. Those cutscenes. We had our own proprietary, uh, proprietary MPEG kind of thing. Um, so yeah, they came to me and said, "We need some music." So. Can you write it in, in a week? And I said, well, no, but I've got a bunch of stuff at home. So I'd written music for the, for the band with, with Mark, Sean, and Eleanor that had never been used as songs, and some of them that had been used as songs and had lyrics. So I went home, or brought the W13 to work, I can't remember which, and, and I edited those songs and took out inappropriate parts. But basically, in 99% of the tracks were left exactly intact as they were, and brought in to use in the in the CD version of Zool. So when you're watching when you're watching that CD32, you, I'm sure you can see the gameplay on on YouTube. But when you're watching that, you have to think these these were songs that had lyrics, and they weren't written for a platform game, a frenetic platform game with a little a little Zool guy. That so some of the songs really don't suit that style but i was really proud to get them in it was amazing for me to all of a sudden have cds for there's the first time in my life that i had cds official cds with printing on them full of my music i think i can't remember if there was eight songs or 10 songs i put on there and i can't remember how many of them were used by the actual game itself but i don't think i wrote anything specific for that, I'd have to go back and look at look at the game, but I think every single one of those tracks came from the Roland W30, um, and they were. Oh, I tell you what, I think one or two of those were from my demo tape that I submitted to get the job. Yeah, that would make sense. That'd be a way to save time because the the letter they sent you was like literally, here is some gameplay from Zool. Why don't you write a song for that? Yeah, exactly that. So I think one of the levels. Oh yeah, there's a level with the uh, like circus kind of sample in it, kind of jumping up and down circus wee kind of thing going on. I think that was one of my demo songs. I think all four of my demo songs ended up in games, in one way or another. They all ended up there, but I think that's where the first one would have ended up because it couldn't go in the Amiga because it was a real song. It was real audio, as Red Book audio, as you say. Right, right. So this was it was all done very very quickly. It was edit these songs and get them in. And that was the first time I'd ever seen the, the, uh, the .wav after a, after a file name. I'd never seen that before. That was the very first time we saw that. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know how to say it. So in, our, in Gremlin, we called them WAV files. And of course, they're WAV files, but Close the, enough. <laughs> they cut the E off. So, but it's funny because this became part of the folklore of the company, you know? WAV files were a thing. And then we started, we started editing the files as waves. So I'd actually be slicing them. We got, there was an editor at the time called Tedit, T-E-D-I-T. And for about two years, I think, every waveform and every song and everything through Gremlin was edited using Tedit. It was the most basic waveform editor you could imagine. The most sample, basically a sample editor, but it could edit whole songs. Uh, so I would do fade outs, crossfades, and things like that using this basic software. So yeah, those songs were literally thrown into that, and they got great reviews. Even though I still, to this day, I don't think I don't think all of those songs suit the music, suit the game. And I'm pretty sure uh, the team didn't, and the testers didn't, and Patrick didn't either. But when you when you're at a time crunch like that, you've you've got no alternative. You have to go with what you've got, you know. And I honestly didn't see any other CD32 games. I couldn't tell you what the other ones sounded like. I don't know if they were good, bad, or ugly. I have no comparison. I don't know if, if I was good or I was bad. It was a delight at the time to finally have CDs. Here's the best thing about this entire experience of being in games. I went from um, Amiga, Super Nintendo, and Sega all the way through to PlayStation and Xbox. And the joy of being there at that pivotal time of music and the very, very early PC games and that being there for, for that time and that being part of that growth of audio. So as audio quality improved, as CD music was introduced, oh, it was bliss. 
truly blessed. Yeah, you're, you're, that's not going to happen again. No. You're, you're kind of lucky to be there at the time. Incredibly, like, I, I could not pick a better time to be involved. And also, I missed out, thankfully, on the time when games sounded like digital watch alarms. You know, they all... Do, 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 do. They missed out on that horrendous period where you had one sound and you had to write an entire piece with it. You just barely missed out on it, too. Just. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in the perfect point in the middle where it cro- I was so lucky. There's no, there's no talent or art about it. It was pure luck to be there at that time. It was luck that my, my ability and my passion met, crossed over perfectly with that timing. And I remember so many blissful moments of, of uh, transition from machine to machine and quality to quality, being able to go up in quality. So another thing that came full circle was the the sound chip from the, from the Yamaha CX-5M. When I arrive at Gremlin, I think my second or third gig was to write um, the soundtrack, I think, for Lotus 3. I can't remember exactly, for the Sega Genesis. I think it was Top Gear 2. Top Gear 2? Uh, yeah, I think that's what it was. I was going to ask if you did that. I guess that's what it was. No, Pat, I think... I think Barry Leach did Top Gear 1, Pat did Top Gear 2 and 3, I think. It must have been one of the Lotus anyway. So day one of that, so they bring me in a piece of kit and uh, they say, here you go. So this this is a synthesizer inside. There's a synthesizer chip built by Yamaha inside this machine and it's based on a DX9. (laughs) No way. So I actually look at the chip because it's taken the, you, you know, the lids. Nothing at Gremlin was permanently put together the lids were off you know everything was like bare bones and opened up like the hood was off a car engine that's how the dev studios were yeah yeah exactly all dev studios are like that i'm sure so i look at the chip and it's exactly the same chip as it was in my msx so seven years later they give me this thing and like here's how it works oh you don't have to tell me how it works (laughs) i've played this thing to death i know how to make any sound in in a second you know so it was absolutely fantastic to all of a sudden be faced with the, this thing I'd actually trained for on my own, to be faced with it as a career. Now I'm here at 25 and I'm making these sounds with this chip. It's just an amazing, it's such an exciting thing to happen. And I, all these things keep coming around. Um, yeah, so like one thing after another. So I'm in a multi, multi-track, uh, multi-monophonic uh, tracker, and then this, this sound chip. It just felt like, it was slowly easing me into this great new job. I wanted to talk a little bit, a bit about, um, in our emails, you've had a few things to say about MIDI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, MIDI is a fantastic invention. It enabled us to connect equipment from one, you know, from sequences to synthesizers and things like that. But it also, in its early days, it was really flawed. And we would get these crashes constantly caused by midi um between certain synthesizers or samplers or whatever it was you were trying to trigger you would get these crashes so that annoyed me so we we me and mark barrett used to call them midi fucks the the basically the the software would crash so this used to happen on everything from the msx through to the mirage everything we ever had had some kind of midi crash happening and then when it came to composing music for um, the PC, there, was, there were multiple ways of creating the sound for that. But the, the posh way, the modern way, became what was known as the general MIDI sound set. That's the one. Yeah, which was, to most people, this was an amazing advance in computer music. What it gave you was, instead of... Ho- uh, old sound blaster cards used to be sample based so very similar to the amiga but somehow never as good as the amiga i don't know why that was but nobody ever did me i don't think the music sounded as good on the old pc games as it did on the amiga but it was very similar technology i understand i can't really remember it's a long time ago but then all of a sudden this gm sound set came around it was 127 sounds so in in that you would have something like five bass sounds, two bell sounds, three string sounds, two kick drums, three snare drums, two hi-hats. So it was full of this 127 sounds. 
I can still remember the numbers of some of the sounds, but the vast majority of these sounds were awful. Absolutely awful. They were sterile and they were created by somebody's grandma in a basement. They were truly disgusting sounds. But to most people, they actually absolutely loved them. And I used to read about other games musicians telling me, say, say how they absolutely adored writing with these fabulous new sounds. Because compared to some things, they were fantastic. But I honestly prefer that DX9 sound chip in the, in the Mega Drive, the, the Genesis. I so prefer writing for that and creating sounds in there because you could change them. These GM, the GM sound set, they were fixed. A bass was a bass was a bass. And the reason for that was the original GM sound set was created by Roland. They were the gods. That, they, they, that was a top tier of sound at the time. So they created this sound set. So number 35 was a bass. Their number 35 was a really clean, I think it was a soft bass, but it was a really clean bass. It was brilliant. But then you've got other companies like Sound Blaster did their version of the GM sound set which wasn't quite as good. However, it was still a soft bass, and number 12 was still a kick drum or whatever it was at the time. So what that meant was other sound cards could do their own copy of the GM sound set, and every, in theory, every PC would have a similar sound. So I could write a song using this GM127 sounds, and it would sound the same on every PC, in theory. But in reality... I would walk around the company at Gremlin and listen to all the different sound cards because everybody had different sound cards and go through the test room with the guys in test and I would hear my songs being destroyed by other sound cards. But even then, even on the Roland sound, it was awful. It was so sterile. I write songs around a music around sounds. I want interesting sounds. I don't want the same standard bass sound on every song. Every sound, song sounds the same if, if you're using exactly the same sounds to me, unless you're the kind of person who composes in a traditional way. So if you're good at orchestral composition, for example, like Chris Adams, if you listen to a game like, um, what was it called? Slipstream, that Chris Adams did the soundtrack for Gremlin. His composition, and I think Pat Phelan did some as well, their orchestral composition and the use of the orchestral sounds in there and their use of the general MIDI and the ability in the sequences to uh, huge, use different emphasis and tricks on the sounds was absolutely terrific. So orchestral stuff, I thought, sounded fantastic. But every time I had to use those sounds, I, I wanted to shoot myself. I hated it with a passion. What, what was beyond me, and still is beyond me, is that Roland turned this into a synthesizer. So you could buy this to take it home and play these sounds. It was worse than a home Bon Tempe organ to me. It was absolutely awful. Wait, worse than your first organ? Worse. <laughs> absolutely. It was less inspirational. That windy, that wind organ was, had a one, one wonderful sound. <laughs> the GM127 had no, no, no wonderful sounds for me. I did like the bell. It had a really great, crispy, clean bell. Um, but you can only write one song with that, and then they all sound the same. What was it called? It, th 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 then they released a unit, didn't they? Like a little standalone, was it a D110 or something? That was the Sound Canvas uh, SC88, that, I believe. That's it, the Sound Canvas. And me and you had talked about that, and I think at some point we had that little box, the SC88. I think that was there in the in the studio at some point. I think I used it for something. Yeah, I know uh, Pat did, at least with a few soundtracks, even Red Book. I think that's what happened in, in a particular... I think me and you had discussed it. I think it might have been Fatal Racing, which is called Whiplash in the States. I think I'd written... I think I'd written that with a sampler and written Red Book with a proper sampler, you know, the Akai, uh, the Akai sampler, and used fantastic sounds. But I think some of the sounds were from the, from the sound canvas just because I'd, I'd had to write DOS versions you know, I'd had to write basic general MIDI versions. When it came to writing the Red Book versions, I did a half and half, some kind of hybrid of general MIDI. And, and, that, and when you listen to the whiplash sound, you can hear, I always call it the Seinfeld bass. You can always, 
you know, that slap bass sound. And I think that's from the general MIDI set. And it's clear, clearly heard in the Whiplash soundtrack, much to my chagrin. Yeah, I think I recall hearing um, the drum set in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure some people are fantastic with it. It's just not how I write. I'm inspired by sounds. Yeah, I, I understand both camps. But like, if if you give somebody who's inspired by sound design the uh, sound canvas, they're just not going to like it. That's just how it is. No. I've listened to your music, and I think you could make that sing. Like how you, you, your phrasing with certain, and how you, how you um, what's the word? How you use pitch bend. Yeah, yeah. And your phrasing. I think you could make that sing. As best as, as as good as well as anybody. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's, uh, I like. I have both philosophies. I think sometimes it's really fun to just take a limited sound set like that and just try and crank out as much as you can from it. Yeah. I mean, very very early, the very first thing I ever touched was a, a Casio used to make little monophonic keyboards. The famous one was the VL tone. Do you know about that? Yeah, yeah. So before the VL tone there was an even less powerful one. And I got that for Christmas. That was my first keyboard, really. But literally, it was the size, it was about 20 centimeters long. And uh, it was monophonic. And the sounds were a bit like uh, very early video games. Very, very early. Very, very simple sounds. Um, And it used to have a very, very basic arpeggiator in it. It wasn't really an arpeggiator. What it was was it would record. It was a recorder, so you could play these monophonic patterns. So a bass, a bass would sound like any other sound. They were very similar sounds, and you could record them into the recording, into the recorder, and then play, play it back at different speeds, which made it sound like a fast arpeggio, which was really cool. It was the first thing like that, you know. And so exactly what you're saying, if you've got a really, really restricted palette, then there's a challenge there. And there's something about trying to get the best out of it. But unfortunately, at that point, when the sound canvas sounds, and the, the general MIDI 127, whatever they were called, when those sounds appeared I, and I was forced to be doing them, at the same time, I believe I just started doing CD Redbook. That's a downgrade, yeah. It's a massive downgrade. Having to take a backward step, we could pull CD audio from, uh, well, we could pull WAV files from the PC CDs at that point as well. So we can have CD audio pulling from a CD. If you almost CD audio, you know, yeah, it wasn't playing like CD. It was pulled as a, as a, as an audio file, but you could have really high quality audio like that. So you've got all this capability and the reason that they made me do it. So I think I had to do three different styles for a PC game, which just drove me nuts. The reason I had to do it and I understood it, the sales team, had sold all of our PC games as a tie-in with loads of different cards. So if you bought the Sound Blaster 64 or whatever it was called at the time, you got a free copy of D- uh, Jungle Strike with it. So the music had to work on every single card, and it had to show off the strengths of every card. So there was a lot of that going on at the time. So unfortunately, I had to write quite a few games using that sound set. And it just upset me. And also, everybody walking into your office, office, it's a studio, everybody walking into the studio, and you're playing that. They look, what are you writing? This is terrible. You know, it was embarrassing. It was absolutely humiliating. And I could not, for the life of me, make it sing. And that's because I had no, it was like a knot in my stomach. I had no passion for it and no interest in it. I think you said it worked well for military soundtracks, though. It really did. So it worked, I run, that's a great, great observation. It worked fantastically well for Jungle, jungle and Desert Strike. Those... Yeah. You know, and the, the, the president's coming in and you're playing those cheesy presidential tunes. There's some, we turned, unfortunately, we turned Desert Strike and Jungle Strike into a comedy you know, with the cutscenes. Anybody that's listening to this, watch the cutscenes for Je- <laughs> that Gremlin did for the PC version 
of Jungle Strike and Desert Strike. They're absolutely magnificent. Our spy satellite picked up that communication along with these photographs at the blast area. Good thing Congress didn't cut the space program. Enhanced photo. These are our boys. Carlos Ortega. The acting, there's actors, real actors. The acting is horrendous. The audio is horrendous. And because of that, the, the, the audio was badly recorded. It wasn't me. Somebody, they recorded it in a, in a warehouse with a restaurant underneath. So you can hear doors slamming while they're talking. And so you've got these terrible actors. I'm sure they weren't, but they were in this game. And they're de delivering terribly cheesy lines. And the sound is awful. So I just decided to make the, sound, the music cheesy. So I... <laughs> I did it as cheesy as possible. And so you've got these the presidents coming in. Da, 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 and I would make I would distort <laughs> using the pitch bend and make it sound really bad. So it's good to watch. I really enjoyed and bear in mind as well, it's important to say that the tunes on Jungle Strike and Desert Strike weren't written by me. I did cover versions of them. Yeah, that's right. It's like the only time you did an arrangement, I think. Yeah, it is. And I absolutely loved it, I'll be honest. And I think I loved it because it was easy to, to do that by ear with that game. I could hear all the notes easily and I could convert them to, to PC or what I used. I, I think, I don't know, anyway, doing them on PC using that was, was really nice because it's a decent military snare sound, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, what you're doing is you're mimicking what a military band would do. So you're mimicking real sounds from a real orchestra, and that's what they did for that. It's a very clever idea, that 127 sounds, and they covered all the basses. There was an oboe, there was a violin, there was a viola, there was a cello, there was a timpani. All the sounds were there. Everything you wanted. I can't remember all of them, to be honest, but they, everything was there from a full orchestra. So every instrument that would have been in, the military, in a military band was represented in the GM sound set. Yeah, another thing is um, something that ended up kind of cruel, in my opinion, was you ended up having to use that MIDI sound set to write SNES music. Yeah, it was an odd situation. Um, I don't know how anybody else did it. I can, I can tell you, Pat actually used an Amiga, so you were really shortchanged on that one. Pat used an Amiga? Yeah. I didn't know that. I wonder why I didn't do that. He like, wrote the tunes on Amiga and ran it through a converter, and it kept all the samples intact. No way! That's devastating. That's before me. Yeah. So I got the worst version after. Yeah. Oh, man. You know what, though, being honest, I don't know if that's my fault. I can't remember what happened. I'll tell you why. That's an interesting, that's a really great fact. I'm glad you shared that with me. Um, if you think about it at that time, I'd moved from Amiga Pro Tracker to a very basic TV screen with this old school technology. So I'd move from that onto Cubase version 2.1 or 3.1, whatever, really early version of Cubase. Cubase was the most amazing step up in sequencing. It was light years ahead. And now I'm sequencing using this. I could do things like I could, if I had double notes, there's a thing called delete double, so you can delete duplicate notes and just thousands of little tricks inside Cubase. It was a wonder when it arrived. So if somebody came to me and said, you've got to do a a game for the Super Nintendo, you can either do it on Cubase or Tracker, I would have definitely said Cubase. But now, knowing what I know now, I would have definitely written songs in the Amiga. And you know what? That explains why some of those Snake songs sound fantastic and mine are dreadful. <laughs> really. It truly, truly... I remember hearing somebody doing a game it was based on rock and roll. It was called something like Rock and Roll Racer. Oh, yeah, that was uh, Tim Fallon, actually. Oh, uh, you know the stuff. The music was outrageous. And I'm like, how did he do that? I remember walking in to see Ash Bennett and, and Mike, Michael Hurst, the uh, coder and artist on the top all top gear games all top three of the top gear games they basically they did most of the art and all of the coding between them on all three of those games 
I remember going to their office and going, have you heard the sound on that? Why can't I do that? Why does his sound like that? Why can't I have more of the cartridge space for audio? Look at their game. They've got hundreds of cars. They've got hundreds of levels. What the hell? <laughs> and they never said to me, that's because you're writing on the, on the, on Cubase instead of in Amiga. If I'd have known I could write in Amiga, I could have made great stuff for those games. But you know what? I'm, I might be remembering that incorrectly. It might have been my stubborn wanting to use uh, Cubase instead of going back to the tracker. Yeah, it's hard to say. It, well, the impression I got was that Cubase was just the new de facto software at the time. So that's what everybody was using. Yeah. And you just, if you were on the SNES, so you kind of got to crush this new software back onto the old hardware. Exactly that. So basically what I would do is I would walk from my room down the corridor to, to Ash's room. I would give him a, a file which was a MIDI file, he would put it into the game. I would play him the song in my studio. He would put the file into the game, and then he'd try and find sounds to replace the ones that I'd used. So he'd go, oh, that's a bass sound. I know what that is now. So he'd find a bass sound inside of sna the snares from previous samples that they got, or I don't know where he got them all from, but he got, he got samples that Pat had created. And he'd try and make my songs sound like mine. So a coder try and make my songs sound like my songs instead of an audio guy doing it. And I love, I love Ash to bits, but you can imagine that's going to, it's going to take a hit. I still think they did a really great job of, of it. I listened to Top Gear 3000 and they did a decent job of mimicking my general MIDI songs. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I, I wrote songs in general MIDI, which is why they were uninspired, which is why, even though I like them now, I always used to hate my uh, SNES music because I, I thought I'd written them with the GM sound set, and the, which is soulless. So I thought my songs are soulless because of that, you know? Even today, I thought you don't like uh, Newman Haas' uh, Indy Car Racing, the song no. I included in my mix. You said you still don't like that. I can't believe that's a thing. I can't believe that's a thing. I can't believe it's on YouTube. It's embarrassing. And uh, that <laughs> truly is embarrassing. In fact, that game was embarrassing. Um, at the time, for me, they ca they came to me. I don't know how long I had, like a few days or something. They said we need sound effects. How did I not know about this game three months ago that we were going to develop it? I had no idea. So I think they came to me with three days or something like that. And of course, it's it's my it's a long time ago, but something like that. And I just had no time to write songs. I think they needed eight songs for eight levels or something like that or six. There's no way I could write good songs in that amount of time. And for that machine, you have to be kidding. <laughs> so um, I remember them coming to me and saying, haven't you got anything you haven't used before, anything you rejected? So yeah, that ended up being all my rejected ideas. Everything that was terrible that wasn't good enough to be used in a video game went into that Newman Haas. Or it went into the... Um, it was either that. And there's, like, there's, a, there's soccer rejects in there. There's, <laughs> there's all sorts in there. And or it was either that or the awful, the more awful um, ski do or C do game. What was that one called? Full Throttle Racing. Full Throttle Racing, yeah. The very, very worst songs I ever wrote are in Full Throttle Racing. And it's amusing to me to go and look on YouTube and people that have fond memories of them because to them, that was their game, their soundtrack, and it's their happy memory from their childhood. It's just for me personally as an artist at the time. I was, I was uh, struggling with letting these weaker tracks out of my studio, but I had absolutely no choice. So in they went. They're not dreadful, but they're dreadful to me. They're unfinished, and they're weak and predictable and cliched. That's what I'd say. Yeah, uh, I don't have the childhood memories for these games, actually, but uh, I'd still say it's a little like undercooked is the word I would use. That's a great, that's a flattering way of putting it. Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, like, it, it, even in my mix, you'll notice I layered uh, drums on top of the uh, uh, IndyCar racing tune. That's very kind of you. <laughs> but I still think there's a, there's a good seed of an idea there. Good enough to include. Yeah. This is it, you see. This is what they were. I think my, my friend Mark Barrett always says the best bit of writing a song is the first eight bars, the first eight bar loop. And it's true. You write an eight bar loop and then you start building a song from there. So that might become the chorus or the verse or the middle eight or the intro. 
but it starts with an eight bar loop and all of those songs would have just been an eight bar loop and then i would have quickly tagged on extra bits and then when they weren't when i found they weren't working or they sounded tired or cliched or derivative then i would get rid of them and so when i listen to them with plodding bass lines with predictable notes um then you know i get upset about that and uh, oh god no, oh, that's got my name on it. You know, that kind of stuff. It's just stupid pride of a teenage idiot, you know. Yeah, just a little bit. Although uh, Top Gear 3000, I think that sounds just good objectively. Thank you. I, I'm i fond of it now. And I'm probably more fond of it because that gets a lot of love online. It gets a lot of love on YouTube. Like there's a song in there. I did a an homage to Route 66, I think, in there. The classic song i think everybody's covered that i did an homage to that it wasn't a cover version but i did a bass line that was similar to that and there's some nice tricks in that i listened back to it recently and there's some nice tricks in there and there's i'm not ashamed of that one uh but i, I just i wish i could have done it in the amiga it would have sounded way better oh, well obviously <laughs> yeah yeah i'm disappointed about that i could have done a really good job uh, how long did it take you to start getting like fan mail for that game or any game really it all came way later. I mean, I used to get things like, uh, when I was actually making the games, very little, I would occasionally get something from a kid, like a little kid, uh, with a nice drawing of Zool, um, things like that. And I'd occasionally get a phone call asking how I did things, um, or when is the next one coming out. Sometimes they'd, they'd think I did the whole game, you know, not just the music. Um, but fan mail specifically, or people contacting me, started to happen probably 10 years after I finished writing, or 5 to 10 years after I finished writing them all. And the bulk of it happens now. Um, a lot of people will um, find my name or whatever, and then try and guess where my email is or whatever, and contact me that way, or they'll get in touch with me through YouTube and places like that. And it, I love it. I think it's fantastic. But the first, the first piece I can ever remember, I did a, a CD soundtrack, full CD audio, to Lotus Trilogy. So I think it was all three of the games on the CD32. And I wrote those songs from scratch. And I absolutely love those songs, even now. I absolutely love them. And um, I was really proud of them. I don't think they're all perfect for a racing game. I don't. I, they don't all suit it. They're not all fast, up-tempo, throbbing bass lines. But it's really nice music. It's my, some of my favorite stuff. And I think the first piece of fan mail I can ever remember was a guy found me and wrote to me, and he said, I just want you to know that I have a Lotus, and the CD that I play most in my car is your CD. Right now, I'm, I've just finished driving around Wales listening to your, your Lotus trilogy. Like, that's just fantastic. That's what you want to hear as a composer, you know? Yeah, for real. It makes me happy just hearing about it vicariously, you know? Yeah, it was a beautiful moment for me. And then, and then weird things happened. Um, I found out that Top Gear 3000, when it was released, was one of the most pirated games in South America. So every kid had a copy of Top Gear 3000. And it became like a cult thing. And then people started telling me, it wasn't just the game. They would, they would record on cassette the soundtrack, and then they would make copies of the cassette. So we've got kids in Brazil where a whole high school was listening to my Top Gear 3000 soundtrack and passing it around between them and thinking, this can't be real. And then more kids from Brazil and Chile and different countries started joining in, saying, yeah. yeah, yeah. Then, you know, I ended up doing a, a Twitch interview um, with with somebody from brazil and then people doing cover versions in fact it's funny the most cover versions i've got are from the top gear 3000 uh, soundtrack there's loads of different mixes of those techno versions guitar versions one guy plays every single instrument using a guitar uh, this is this is a dream come true having someone make a cover version of your song is probably the ultimate you know honor for a musician i think and if you imagine writing those Top Gear 3000 songs in a little studio in Sheffield and then 25 years later some Brazilian guys playing guitar 
a guitar version of it it's just to the world on the internet it's just dream come true stuff isn't it yeah for real it just blows my mind all that stuff the the advent of youtube is remarkable if youtube had been around at the time i think i'd have got more feedback i would have known what was good and bad um inside the only thing i thought i was doing poorly was i wasn't correctly matching i wasn't getting the vibe of driving games correctly every time i thought sometimes i could Pat, patrick feel and seemed to get that right all the time he just had a knack for writing fast uh, connected songs that worked great for driving games but in my own defense it was almost every week I had a driving game. I did so many of them, and it became so tiresome. Also on the topic of driving games, sort of, uh, something else I wanted to talk about is uh, 1995 is when uh, Wipeout happened. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that was the first, but I think it was like the biggest case where a bunch of like outside popular artists were being brought in to do game music. Yeah, this, was, this is one of my favorite memories. Um, the PlayStation had just come out. I don't know how long. It's just in my in my memory, it was a new thing. And Wipeout was released, and Wipeout was popular. It was a great game. It was a truly magnificent game for a start. It was the, for me, it was the best game on the PlayStation One by a long, long way. The you were it was basically flying a spaceship down a track, and it was so difficult and challenging and beautiful. The graphics were stunning we'd never seen graphics like it the sound effects were absolutely magnificent and then the songs weren't just cool songs by some in-house musician and they weren't just cool songs by uh by professional musicians you know by signed artists these were cool songs by the coolest people like i don't remember who did it but bands like apex twin and um, beaumont hannant and Black Dog, I think. All I remember is uh, the Chemical Brothers were in it. Chemical Brothers. Yeah. It, nobody had ever done this before. It was mind-blowing. And then the, the, the cover art was stunning. And then the design of the, everything about it was, it was just impeccable. It was a work of art. And it was cool. It was, it was Factory Records' New Order kind of cool. And it turned out that the art and design and all that stuff had been done in Sheffield by a fantastic team. Um, that, that ended up working with with Gremlin on on various products after that, but they worked. I can't remember who it was. Sony. I can't remember who made. Um, what's it called? What's the game we're talking about? Wipeout. Wipeout. Yeah, I can't remember who made it, but they worked with. Um, they'd worked with them first, and then they ended up working with Gremlin on a bunch of projects, and every single team that worked on Designers Republic, they were called. Oh man! Yeah, yeah. You'd got Warp Records around the corner from Gremlin. Literally, Warp Records had a record shop that sold, you know, sold records right around the corner on the same block as the Gremlin building. And they had songs on the soundtrack. And Designers Republic, who were built, they were next to um, the Human League studio down, downtown and next to Elliot Kennedy's studio. And so they were part of the cultural... Uh, ferocity of sheffield at the time designers republic they were right on the edge of everything and they had an influence on us i think um martin dust from from black dog was a really key uh part of the design team at that time and a really big influence on the art style and things like that um so watching watching this game wipe out and playing it with with all of us we all sat around going look at this listen to this it was a massive influence and so i find when when the next game came around for me to have some input sometimes i'd have to battle with a producer about the style of music or the type of music or how many songs or whatever things like that sometimes i'd have to battle not very often they normally gave me complete freedom i'll be fair um and just they were everybody was really supportive but sometimes you'd have a lot of input and i just remember watching that and thinking right that's it i'm gonna write you know i'm gonna write fantastic stuff from here on in and i'm gonna take longer and if i remember rightly then i went from writing a song in one day to writing a song in two days so i wrote i can't remember which came first whether it's wipeout or loaded or loaded two i don't know i don't know which what the uh, chronology is but lo loaded for playstation was each song took i think two days 
And that was the first time we'd ever had a signed band. So I wrote a bunch of tracks, Pat wrote a, a couple of tracks, and then the marketing department signed Pop Will Eat Itself to do two tracks on the soundtrack for that. And I was so excited to be, I love that band. And I got their records and people had actually brought me their records and said, uh, play this uh, when you're going to write music for Loaded, play this. And they brought me Ministry and Metallica, I think Metallica. They brought me a few bands as in inspiration. Well, I didn't want to write rock. I wanted to write um, Pop Elite itself kind of rock. I wanted to write guitar stuff, but techno stuff and hard stuff. But I could never do what Pop Elite itself did because each one of their tracks was done by multiple people in a studio over months, whereas each one of my songs was done in two days. But it was a real thrill to have, have that band on that CD and, you know, have my stuff on the same CD as them. It was a massive thrill at the time. And it became hugely popular. And I think that some of, you know, I still get a lot of great feedback about that. That's some of my best music. I was, I was wondering if there's like a direct link between uh, Wipeout and uh, getting Pop Will Eat itself onto Loaded. It, it sounds like it came from the marketing team. Yeah. Though. Pop Elite itself definitely came from the marketing team. We had, it was a great team down there, and we had a musician down there as well on the team, a guy called Steve McKevitt. Um, he was in loads of bands around Sheffield. I'm not sure if he got signed in the end, um, but he was in, in loads of bands, and he was a cool guy. And uh, thank God, because if you'd got a bunch, you know, most marketing teams are full of squares with great suits, you know. But we had cool people. They were all cool down there. And... Um, so Pop Elite itself was definitely driven by the marketing team, but they may have heard about Wipeout and gone looking for the right, the right band. But I suspect that they would have been influenced. Pop Elite itself was popular along with the Ministry and uh, Wonder Stuff and bands like that. They were popular among our designers, uh, like Adrian Carlos. Um, you know, they, they were really key bands at that time along with bands like Faith No More and people like that. But that, that was the kind of music. It was that kind of grunge, England's version of grunge. So I think it was either marketing-driven or design team-driven. And I don't... The thing is, when you're in game development, you're, you're seeing and hearing about games before you're doing them, before, you, before they release, sorry. So, for example, we would have heard... We would have heard Wipeout, or so I didn't, but somebody would have heard Wipeout before it was released. And somebody who used to work at Gremlin would have been on that Wipeout team, for example. So we would have heard that there was going to be a, a Chemical Brothers song. And also, people were bringing me Chemical Brothers CDs. When you're, an audio, when you're an audio guy in a video game company, people are constantly bringing you CDs and saying, hey, listen to this, I want you to do this. And it's, it's a big battle normally. I'm not putting that, you know. So, but in this particular case, I was over the moon that Wipeout this, that soundtrack was popular and that that game was so fantastic and at that time everybody that was cool started playing all the warp music so Aphex Twin was huge uh, Square Pusher was huge, Beaumont Hannant um, Orteca people like that all that stuff was being played between me and my friends at that time Oh yeah, didn't you say you actually met um, Richard James Aphex Twin? So Aphex Twin, I didn't meet him I when I was working for Codemasters, um, they had, I can't say too much, but they had a plan for a game and they wanted him to be a part of it. So I had a really interesting few emails with him. Um, I couldn't believe I was emailing him. It was bizarre. I was a bit starstruck. The emails were really simple and really interesting. He was such a down-to-earth, normal guy. He was excited by the ideas. Uh, nothing came to fruition, but it was just a real treat to be in touch with him. Another one was, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, from LFO. Mark Bell. Mark Bell. Mark Bell came to the office. Um, I, th I don't know if he was friends with Martin Dust or, or if he was just a fan of games. I'm not sure, but one day the door opened and, and in, in walked Mark Bell. He's like, hey, you know, and we just sat down for a chat. I couldn't believe he was sitting there. <laughs> like, what? And he wanted to know all about everything I do. And I'm like, I want to know everything about you, what you do, you know? So we sat there swapping stories about things. And he was sharing stories about uh, being in Malibu, writing music for Bjork and um, different synthesizers and stuff he was buying and how it felt 
ridiculous. I was saying how it was amazing to me to be, a, you know, a, a guy from a small village, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And he was saying the same thing. I think he was from Leeds, and he was saying, it's just ridiculous to me to be in Malibu, opening my curtains, looking out at the ocean, and then going and doing a remix that's going to be famous all over the world, you know? So it's, it's, you have to, that certain people ground you, you know? And people like that are, are always stay grounded. Same with Mar Martin Dust from Black Dog, same with Mark Barrett from Future Loop Foundation. The, these guys have stayed with their feet glued to the floor. And I think that's partly that Northern ethic, Northern English ethic, work ethic. And, and that, um, I'm sure we all still have egos, but we're all very down to earth about it and, and very um, self-deprecating or whatever, you know. I mean, that matches my experience with you. So whatever that's worth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever, did you meet uh, anybody from Pop Will Eat Itself? No, that's an interesting story. So what actually happened was, they they'd made a new album and the new album was going to be on reloaded or some of the tracks were so i was going to write some they were going to write some so the record company sent me the new album on a cassette and what used to happen at the time was they would deliberately downgrade the quality of cassette of demos so that nobody would duplicate it and make money so i got the album the new album by pop Elite itself and i put it in and i wasn't i didn't really understand what was going on. I put it in and I thought, this is terrible audio. Listen, I could do better than this. But the songs were fantastic. And then somebody from marketing came up and said, I need that cassette back. The pop will eat itself have broken up. <laughs> what? The album's not getting released. Nobody can ever hear it again. And it was taken from me. And that's it. I don't know if it was ever released or if it's been released now or whatever. But it was like the great unreleased album that was almost on a video game. It was a really cool story. It even looked terrible. It looked like it had been thrown around someone's bag for weeks. It was something you could never sell. Um, but the songs were fantastic. I don't know if they were finished. I don't know if they were mastered. Um, but there they were. And they were given to us as a precursor to dropping them into, into uh, Reloaded when Reloaded was finished. The downside to that is, of course, they, they were never in the game. But the upside was I got completely free reign to do whatever I wanted with reloaded and at the time i was listening to drum and bass and mark barrett my friend my best friend was writing drum and bass and i never copied anybody i never used anybody's never sampled anybody or anything like that i just did what i thought what i felt drum and bass would be in a video game and that included some stylized things so i did one track is very like you have to think you think when you're writing a song for a video game there's levels so there's a level that's got the desert in it so you want some desert feel to it or like like on Zool with the bulb level you need some electric electric sign sounds you know you, so you're trying to at the same time stylize and theme a song at the same time as having them all work as a coherent CD as an album and then um having them be cool so I wanted to write real drum and bass, but having it work for a game. So I wrote them fast and furious because Loaded was fast and furious. It turned out that Reloaded wasn't quite as good. The gameplay wasn't quite as good. You're wandering around a lot, big, a lot a, a, in big open spaces, like desert scenes were just wide open. And it just didn't have the fun. And, and people had moved on from that gauntlet style of game to much different games. So by the time Reloader was released, it was already looking a bit old school. But I, I absolutely love my soundtrack to that, and I've got a lot of love for that. And in addition to the songs on Loaded and Reloaded, in addition to the songs that are used in the game, I've put in extra tracks or secret hidden tracks, whatever you want to call them. So there's a lot of my ideas, 8-bar loops or unfinished tracks that I really loved, that those two CDs are packed full of tracks by me yeah i think the majority of the tracks and uh, loaded were uh hidden tracks yeah that's true the reason for that i can tell you that that's an open secret at this point i think what actually happened was back in the day how music was worked out music payment music rights royalties all that stuff they hadn't fully agreement in video game industry yet as to how they were going to pay for per copy of a of a record sold because in in the music industry there's it's split between the people who played on the record and the publishing side for the people who wrote the record but 
what do you do on a video game? Do you split it three ways? Do you split it 10 ways? Does the artist get a cut? Does the coder get a cut? The owner? How's it split? So nothing had been truly worked out by that point. I still don't know how it's done today. So at this point, what actually happened was they negotiated a price. It was a bit cheeky at the time. They negotiated a price and they said, look, we'll pay you. I don't know what it was, but we'll pay you 10 cents. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to put $1 per CD aside for the music. We want two of your songs. So they might have figured at the time they're getting 50 cents per song per copy sold. So that somebody from sales came to me and said, look, we've done this deal. There's two of their songs. We need there to be 20 of yours. <laughs> what? Because they're not going to give me the money. They need their money to be a tiny amount. So <laughs> I'd already written, I don't know, six songs for in-game. I think Pat had done two or three. So nine songs of ours and two songs of theirs. They were already getting a tiny cut. So then I went away back to my trusty W30 and went through all the other songs that I thought were good. And then I put them, put them all in the game. So the original version of Loaded is packed full of filler and the games aren't, the songs are just literally hidden. I don't think it took people long to find them. And uh, they're just there. They just stick the CD in and it plays. And the first two songs are probably eat itself. Then it's me, then it's Pat. And then it comes back to my ideas and ditties and unfinished songs. And one of the most loved songs I ever had, I ever wrote for any game is one of those extras. So it just shows you, I'm really glad I included them. Um, but it was a fun story at the time. I don't know if they felt duped. They broke up anyway. Um, and I don't think they would have made millions. But it did save, it saved Gremlin having to spend a ridiculous amount of money on songs. Lots of stuff happened like that, right? Like we made the, the we made Premier League manager. And they, there's no way they could afford to bring in pay, pay commentators at that point. So I sampled Match of the Day, which is the soccer show in England. And... Um, it was a pretty lawless time for sampling, if you remember. But at the time, in the early games that I did, I was sampling from all over the place. But I wasn't, I wasn't using in context other than in the soccer games, which, which, what a great goal, he really hit that. You know, I was using those samples. But the other samples I was doing, I was deliberately sampling for my own pleasure and hiding the samples and using them out of context. So I had Marquis Smith saying, fall, fall. Um, and he'd, used, he'd said the word fall once in a song, and I'd managed to sample it and remove the, the rest of the sound in there. And then I'd used it completely out of context. And I, did, I, I sampled a guitar sound from Robert Smith and used it for a whole song. You would never tell in a million years because it's completely out of context, and I played it as though it was a guitar. Um, things like that, you know. I used individual sounds that I sampled instead of pieces like, so De La Soul would sample riffs and bass lines and chord patterns and old pieces of jazz drumming whereas i would be clever about it and use individual sounds so there's one of my songs got a, a robert smith sample from kiss me kiss me kiss me the album and i just used that one fantastic jing and then i played a whole song with it so at that time i could do things like that there's no way on earth i would ever get away with that today or try and do it today but at the time you were trying to you were you were having fun and every coder was hiding, hiding stuff. And every artist was hiding stuff in games. There was loads of hidden stuff in games. And but somebody, in, somebody in Sheffield was put in prison, I think, for a day or something for graffiti. People couldn't believe they'd been put in prison for graffiti. So we put a tombstone in a game with his name on it. You know, things like that. There, were, there was hidden stuff all over. It's amazing. People think that the only hidden stuff was hidden games or secret passwords. But... You know, one of my friends used to hide his phone number in every single game. There was so much fun we had, and I just wanted my piece of that, so I hid all sorts of stuff in those games. There's backwards samples from movies. There's a sample from the movie Diner. There's Ferris Bueller. There's all sorts of stuff in there. Yeah, it was a really Wild West time, and the fun that people had back then is... It's fun to look at back at, I think. Definitely. When I, when I went to Electronic Arts, finally, in Canada... Um, all that stuff had gone. It was corporate. I'm not saying we didn't have some fun at first, but um, all that stuff had gone. And everything was massively litigious because EA had millions and millions of dollars, so they had to be extraordinarily careful. But they had a massive budget. So then all of a sudden I'd got a half a million dollar budget to spend on 
the most amazing soccer players and commentators in the world. So things changed, you know. Yeah. I kind of want to reel it back to the... Uh, I had some questions about uh, Time and Base that was released in the middle of 1996. And I was wondering, like, how close were you to Mark at this time? Were you, like, listening to the CD together? Or, like, what was, the, what was going on between you two at the time? Yes, we were back. We were we were friends. I can't remember the chronology of the fallout, the big meltdown, and and making becoming friends again. But um, just as when he got signed, we weren't talking. But when the album came out, we were talking. Um, let me think. I'm trying to remember the details of that. I think that's right. I remember I remember being a roadie for him for some gigs. He had very heavy gear, so we used to take. It was just him. I and mean, we'd take all this just shows you the efforts we go to to not look like we were miming. He would take his full outboard gear, basically he'd he'd tear down his entire studio and he'd take it on tour with him in a in a white van and we'd do things, we'd go all the way to Strasbourg from Sheffield, like on a ferry, and it would take twelve hours to get there, um, and then play a gig and then come straight home with this massive studio. It was backbreaking. And so when Time and Bass came out and he signed to planet dog and it, it did great i think he was the first person to ever do a live drum and bass gig on on national radio as well um so he was cutting edge drum and bass uh robert smith put that album in his top 10 of all time at that time um it was just it was a superb album and i was amazed how much he'd progressed in the two years or so since we'd been writing music together it was unbelievable but he'd had complete focus and determination on it and he got that gig. He got that. He got signed to Planet Dog by sending away a demo tape, and the cover on the the cover art on the demo tape looked exactly like what was happening in um, in Wipeout. All that kind of design at the time It was three D art. It was very futuristic. And uh, but Mark was connected to all sorts of people in in, in Sheffield, and just like I was. So somebody cool did his artwork for his demo tape. So that demo tape went off. It was beautiful music and it was a beautiful cover and he got signed immediately. So then he's on Planet Dog, which was the coolest label at the time, apart from Factory Records. And um, everybody that was techno wanted to be on Planet Dog. There was Warp as well, um, but that was it. Those were the ones. And if you wanted to do drum and bass, that was such an important label. It was very hippie as well. It was very... It was a 50-50 split, kind of like, like Factory Records was. Um, so he got a really good deal, and he sold a lot of records, and he toured all over the place. So he, he had a great life. And like I say, by the time he, that, by the time he was touring that album, we were, we were going around playing stuff together. It was great. Was that album a conscious like, influence for you, especially for your work on Reloaded? No, it really wasn't. It's strange that, isn't it? Because we, me and Mark, I think we influenced each other throughout until that point no it really wasn't um i did play that album to death and i did love it but it wasn't it definitely wasn't an influence i was listening to other drum and bass but i'm not somebody that sits and listens and copies but i was listening to ltj bookham um which was great at the time and i was listening to um uh, jake slasinger uh was a really cool album. oh yeah yeah um that was really cool and innovative uh, that's that's quite similar to the music you do in places, and music. What was his name? Uh, Mike Peridinas. Well done. That's exactly what it was. So he went out under multiple names, and he was so incredibly talented. So I was massively influenced by him, and then I was going to clubs in in London and places like that. Whenever I was traveling for the for my work, I would go to clubs and I was hearing drum and bass all over the place and sheffield had so much of it so i remember going to a couple of clubs and just i didn't know any of the bands there was no shazam at the time so i was just soaking up this feel and like i discussed earlier when i very first learned how to write music by listening to hi-hats and stuff that stuff just soaked into me in the clubs and what came out for reloaded was nothing to do with Trum Trum uh, time and bass by mark barrett by future loop foundation it was literally everything that was soaking into me from the clubs and and all the different cds i was playing it was more the zeitgeist not a specific source yeah exactly whereas and we never me and mark never really copied each other we, we always were trying to compete and write better stuff than each other 
Um, that's how it went. It wasn't copying each other's styles. We just had similar influences, be it New Order and Duran Duran and uh, Thomas Dolby early on, you know, things like that. And then later on in 88, it was the Detroit Summer of Love and the, the 303 sound and the 909 and the 808 drum kits. And, you know, we were influenced by the same things rather than each other's specific sound. We would never directly copy or be directly influenced by each other's sound. Even when we were in the same band, you could tell who wrote which song. They were quite different. I'm looking at my notes again, and it's, it's kind of scattered from this point out, but I have a few more uh, specific things I want to ask. I think you might remember this just off the top of your head. It's the um, the title theme for Actua Soccer, where you got yes. uh, Martin Dust to do the vocals. Yeah. Troll, troll, troll. Yeah. What's the, what's the story with that exactly? So Martin Dust was a, a like I said, he was heavily involved in the design and, of, of things at that time for Gremlin Games. And the pill that was on the front, the pill shape, I think the pill became a big thing for one year or two years. The pill shape was huge in, in design. You saw it everywhere. England has this thing, this fashion thing, where something is huge for a year, like everywhere, and then it's gone. And it's so old fashioned, you can never do it again. And that pill, I think when we stumbled onto it, not stumbled onto it, when Martin came up with it and used it, it was very, very early. And I don't think he invented it, but I think he got it before it had been adopted by the mainstream. And so when that, that was really exciting. So he was heavily influenced in the design and the, the, the graphic art, which looked really cool at the time on Actua Soccer. So... He was also a friend and we're from the same village and all that stuff. And we talk about music sometimes. Um, I remember him, him coming up and me talking about this particular song. It was him and Adrian Carlos, Aid Carlos, who's a fantastic games designer, an amazing artist who probably a lot of game fans will know who he is. Um, and they both came up and they were listening. And I'd done this. I wanted it to be a little bit like World in Motion by New Order. I wanted it to have that kind of upbeat, upbeat feel. But I didn't want to do a cheesy rap like it in that song has a really it has a few cheesy raps, which is excruciatingly bad. But it's a great song. And a lot of uh, TV shows in England at the time with with football music were using this kind of happy techno, a little cross between New Order and Happy Mondays. Um, very punchy, very much like World in Motion. And I wanted it to have that same sort of feel. So I did it upbeat. I did it happy. And I did it with kind of jingly jangly chords. And it, when I'd finished it, I thought it was still missing something. It was missing a vocal. I didn't know what to do. So I just asked the two of them to come in. I didn't say a word. I didn't ask them anything. I didn't tell them what to do. I didn't write anything down. I had built a vocal booth next to, the, next to my studio in a Gremlin at the time by then. So we got nice padded walls and everything else and a little window so I could see them. I put the mic on and started recording into the sampler. And everything that they did, I would sample. And then Aid left and Martin left, and I'm left with a load of fantastic samples. And then I spent the next day, two days, three days, whatever it was, cutting them up and making them, making them work in the track. I'm really proud of that. And I think they're absolutely fantastic. I'm really, really happy with it. The picture you painted there sounds like you were luring them into a trap to record them. They were absolutely over the moon. We knew this game at the time it was called a fifa beta it was better than fifa soccer it's the only time that's happened in that way it was miles better than fifa the graphics are better the audio was better the music was better everything was better than fifa and that's why the moment that game came out fifa called me and asked me and headhunted me to go over there and work on fifa but so we were so excited about working on that game so everybody wanted to be involved in everything in it it was just so amazing you can't imagine that time it was just it was one of the most exciting times in my entire life. The feeling in the team was just, we know what we've got here. This is something special. So when I said to them, come in, just do it. They were the two most likely candidates to do this. They're both funny. They're both hilarious. They both got great taste and great style. They're just absolutely majestical human beings. And to have them both working on, I couldn't have picked anybody else. They were amazing. And I knew Martin was a musician. 
Aid wasn't, but I knew Martin was a musician. I knew he'd approach it with good taste. I don't know where he came up with it. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where the source is. And the same with Aid. I think Aid says Hallelujah. Um, I don't know where that came from. But Martin's uh, rap and his me chopping it up, it just seemed to work just like magic. I, I love that memory. There's moments though. I wish I could re-edit it. I wish I could re-edit it because there's just a couple of tiny edits of, of Martin's rap, which I put in just too, too many. You know when you have when you eat too much jello, it's just so good you want more of it. I just kept I just kept piling it in and there's just a couple of wee samples that I would remove. But I love it. Uh yeah. So um are you saying that this is like the game that uh you scored that got you headhunted by EA? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll tell you that story, basically. I'm sitting in my office, and uh, so I think somebody from, like, there was an office with two or three women that ran the office, and somebody came in and said, um, you've had a call from Bruce McMillan, who was the head of EA Canada at the time. He was one of the, the people that owned EA, basically, originally. There was him and his cousin. And... Um, he said, you've had a call from Bruce McMillan in Canada. I'm like, yeah, sure, I have. Thanks very much. And then they went away, and I'm just laughing to myself. I thought, what's this about? Why are they teasing me? And so they went away. And then a couple of days later, one of the coders came in, and he said, I've had a call from Bruce McMillan in Canada. They want me to go. He'd been one of the guys working on Actua. And he said he wants you to give him a call. Are you serious? I said, yeah, he wants you to go and do the speech. What? He wants me to do the commentary for FIFA. So I called him and I said, I'm sorry, I thought it was a joke. And he said, yeah, I thought you would do. And he said, we want to, we want to fly you over here for an interview. I think, fly me from Sheffield to Vancouver. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. So him and him, he flew me and my wife. We, we landed. They put us up in a posh hotel. They took us to an NBA game at the time, the Grizzlies, and the, to an NHL game to see the Canucks. They took us to Whistler skiing on a skiing trip. They took us to, to a nightclub to see a band. I can't remember who we went to see. Um, somebody really cool. Basically, they treated me as though I was a, a, a soccer player being transferred from a big team to a bigger team. I felt like Ronaldo for a week. It was unbelievable. They told me I was going to have some interviews. Seven interviews. I was terrified. I bought this terrible suit. My mom insisted I wore a suit, even though it was video games. I said, Mom, they've headhunted me. I don't have to wear a suit. And I get there and they start, they start selling me. So it wasn't seven interviews. It was seven sales pitches. So they're telling me how fantastic EA is and how wonderful Vancouver is and how I'm going to love working on this team. Like these people have been told to come in here and persuade me to join. I could not believe it. It was that moment Steve Martin calls imposter syndrome and how he, he feels it every time he's in a movie. I just kept thinking, you know who I am, right? You know, it's just me. This makes no sense, any of this. And it was just blew me away. But the thing is, I'd written and developed a speech system in Actua that was better than theirs in FIFA. And it was as simple as that. Not because I'm a genius, just because I had the time to do it. And we were all so excited. We all, we all wanted to be breaking new ground. We all wanted to be better than every other football game in the world. Simple as that. So along with a couple of guys on that team, we developed ca uh, categories, ways of ways of triggering um, things in the game. So to be very simple, if somebody scores a goal from long distance, we'd have a category called long distance goals. And I'd, I'd write 20 lines for that. We pick one randomly. Now this might seem obvious today, but back in the day, nobody was doing it in the same way that we did it. So we had, it was artificial intelligence in speech basically. And we had predictive stuff and it was just amazing. So me, a guy called Kevin Dudley, Phil Rankin, a bunch of coders, all, all, kept, all had input with me and, and came up with ideas. But to the, to the large extent, I created that system and wrote all that speech. And so FIFA wanted me to go over there and put it in their game. So when I arrived, um, so the, the, one little interesting story. So they gave me a contract to sign while I was here on vacation. I'm still in Vancouver to this day. So they, they gave me a contract to sign. And they said, uh, if you just sign here. And I said, I can't sign here. I've got... I thought I was just coming for an interview. Uh, you want me to move to Canada? I've got to go home and talk to everybody. I don't even know what to do. They said, well, if you sign now, we'll give you a $15,000 signing on fee. I'm like, what? That's, you know, footballers get signing fees, not, not 
musicians from Sheffield. Um, are you serious? They said, yeah, and we'll give you this salary. What? So I go home. I'm about to go home. I go to the airport. And they're there waiting for me at the airport, at the gate, before I get on the plane, and gave me more money, like a bigger contract with more money. Like, this is insane. We'd like you to sign it now before you get on the plane. I'm like, what? Do you know who I am? This just made no sense to me. I'll never lose that being down to earth. I just The whole thing is ridiculous to me. And um, so I didn't sign. I took it all home. And uh, I got a phone call from Bruce McMillan saying, you know, you can write anywhere. I don't care where you write the script. You can do whatever you want. You can be on a beach in France. Just want you to write these scripts for me. And I want you to develop it. And I want you to direct the talent. So it was John Motson at the time and Des Lynham. And I think Gary Lineker. I can't remember who it was, but it was a bunch of great talent. And then we got in um, loads of football players like Chris Waddle and David Ginola and people like that. And basically, I could pick who I wanted, more or less. So whatever footballers I wanted. And then I went from country to country recording the speech. It's crazy. All that came out of Actua Soccer because of how I wrote it and how I recorded it. We had a great commentator from the BBC. And how we recorded it, how we triggered it, how we edited it, everything was just, it was better than any other soccer game. I'm not somebody to be big-headed and brag, but it just was better. And... When I arrived at EA, I, they they had no offices in the FIFA on the FIFA floor. They had a whole floor for a game. I think there were seventy people at that time on one game. It was nuts. I'd gone from Actua Soccer was a team of six people, and it beat FIFA with seventy. It's ridiculous. And then um, they put me on a, on the floor in a cube in, on the NHL on the EA NHL floor. So all day long while I'm writing speech, all I can hear is Shanahan up the ice. Shanahan scores. So all day, these tiny little bits of speech. Because NHL is tiny little snippets all joined together, stitched together. They call it stitching. And so stitching these little samples, yeah, they have to be so tiny and so quick and spoken so quickly by the, by the announcer, by the commentator, because that hockey's so fast-paced. But football, soccer is so much slower that I could afford to write things like, oh, what a fantastic goal. He really hit that. And then the color commentator could say, oh, that's right. He's got a smile on his face. His wife's going to be happy tonight. You know, something like that. So instead of just writing bland soccer, I was writing color that was interesting and funny and contextual. And also saying things like, if you, if, if you as, the, as the game player, had shot in certain circumstances before, I could predict that. So I could say, can he get a shot in? Or is he going to cross the ball here? Or, oh, dirty tackle coming in. You know, if I knew somebody was a bad fouler or something like that. So predictive artificial intelligence, for want of a better phrase, speech became a big thing and I developed that. And then that became huge at EA, obviously. That, And to this day, all soccer games use all of those tricks. And they don't pay me a cent. <laughs> yeah, I kind of answered a bunch of questions that I haven't even asked yet. So, <laughs> oh, good, fantastic. Although uh, something that did stand out to me was, um, and you don't have to get into this if you don't want to, but I remember you saying that you were uh, felt like you were kind of disrespected. I think you said treated like furniture at, at the end of Gremlin, and then you had this huge contrast where you treated like a celebrity with, but at EA, like that's a yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I don't, I don't. I, I love the guy. Ian Stewart was the guy that owned Gremlin Graphics. I, have, I don't have a bad word to say about him or anybody else. Um, but my final year at Gremlin was very disappointing uh, in, a, in a few ways. I was working extremely long hours on a lot of projects and doing a lot of um, drudgery, uh, a lot of difficult work, painstaking work on editing audio for a game called Realms of the Haunting. It was a massive live action for a video game with hundreds and hundreds of samples of, of uh, speech that was so badly recorded, not by me. And I ended up having to try and clean them up and then fit, fit them to the, to the speech. It was all at different times having to, to uh, change the speed of the speech to, to fit the video. I don't want to get into the technical stuff about it. It's extremely long-winded and very boring. And I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week, 
they'd pay for a pizza in the evening and stuff like that. And they didn't come and demand I stayed till 11 o'clock at night. But this game had a release date. and There was only me doing it. They'd given the interesting stuff to, a, to another guy, another audio guy. I wasn't bitter about that. He was a great guy and he did great work. Um, but somebody had to do this work and it had to be me. And I, I enjoyed doing the work, but 11 or 12 hours a day, every day. So from 9.30 in the morning till sometimes 11 o'clock and midnight. And I'd, it would be me and one or two other coders there. And we'd lock the building and leave for months. And I mean months. Anyway, I'd been an ass for a raise and I was on a terrible salary at the time. I'd been an ass for a raise and they'd said they couldn't give me a raise. And then I'd heard all these artists were getting raises. I'm like, I'm an artist. Why am I not getting a, a wage increase? And I just felt like I was being taken for granted. I was working crazy hours. And it wasn't everybody that was taking me for granted. I thought it was, it was one manager that was taking me for granted, the guy that had the purse strings at the time. Certainly not the owner, but the, the manager. Anyway, um, lovely guy, by the way. Nothing bad to say about him. But at this time, I don't think he was paying attention to what was happening. And uh, so I went to have a word with him and he said, I can't, I, you know, I can't give you any money. And then I heard this guy got a raise, this guy got a raise. And then it came round to my annual review. And I went, bear in mind that EA had just called me, I think a week before and said, we want you to come over for an interview. And I was thinking, should I go or should I not go? So this came right between the two things, I think. And I go in for this thing and uh, we had a bonus at the time. It was a hundred pounds. And you got £10 for good behavior, £10 for good work, £10 for this, whatever. And every time they had a problem with you, they docked £10. So a maximum of £100. So on any given year, you should expect to get um, 80 or £90 or something like that. For the work that I'd done and the amount of time I put in, I should have got £1,000. I should have got a huge bonus, not 100 And I went in there and he said I'd been late twice. So he docked me 20 pounds. And I said, you do realize I'm here six days a week, 11, 12, and sometimes 14 hours a day for months doing this work. He said, a rule's a rule. If, you, if you're late, you get docked. One of those times I've been to the doctors. So he docked me twice for being late to work, like 10 minutes in the morning. And I walked out of there and I went, I'm out of here. And I, I either, I can't remember what, exactly what happened what day, but that's when I decided I was going to EA. So I think I booked, I booked a week's vacation and flew to EA for the, for the uh, interview and then left. And I had no regrets about leaving at that point because I'd been so badly treated by him in that meeting and at that time financially. Yeah, that's, that's so, unfortunate. Yeah, I loved those guys. And he was a great guy. Um, I just think I was badly managed and I felt like I was taken for granted at that point. And the great irony being, and this is why it feels like a movie to me sometimes, the great irony being, I arrived in Canada and I felt like a celebrity. It was truly unbelievable. Yeah, those, that's two extremes there. Yeah, for real. Yeah. My salary quadrupled overnight, four times the salary. And then when I got there, they, they gave me free games. They gave me, every, just everything was free. Everything was gifted. They treated me like gold for a good year or two years until Bruce McMillan left and then EA changed for the worse. But that's life. I do, I have to, i tell one quick story All right. um, about EA. Because you'd asked me earlier on about, did you, we, did you play games before you started working for Gremlin? And when I arrived at EA, I'm in this cubicle writing, writing the commentary all the time, uh, surrounded by NHLers, right? And my manager at the time, a really lovely guy he comes to see me and he, he said, uh, I, need, I need to see you in my office. I thought, what have I done? And at any point you're waiting for it with the imposter syndrome thing. At any point you're waiting for somebody to catch you out and go, sorry, we realize who you are now. Can you go home, please? Right? You're waiting for that to happen. The yeah, for real. Pulled, right? At any point. I can relate so much to that. Yeah. At any point. So he asked me and I walk in, I'm terrified. And I sit down in the chair. I'll never forget this. He was called uh, Warren Wall. I'll never forget this. And he looked at me. He said, um, the guys that are working around you, I thought, what are they going to say? What have I done? And time went so slowly. They say you're not playing any games. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you, where's your research? What are you, what are you watching for, for games? Where, who, who are you copying? Who are you influenced by? 
I said, I'm not doing any of that. I, the reason I'm here is because I invented these things. I'm at the front. I'm not copying anybody else. I don't want to watch anybody else. I don't want ideas from anybody else. And he said, well, our team all thinks you should play more games. You don't have to play your own games. You can play whatever games you want. But we think you should play more games when you're at work. <laughs> I'm like, what? That was my telling off. You need to play more video games when you're at work. <laughs> I went back. I called my dad. I said, I've just been told off for not playing games at work. It's the most ludicrous thing. I could not believe it. So, That's beautiful. Yeah. So I went and got myself a PlayStation. And I started playing other games and listening to other sound and thinking, oh, they've done speech well. I, I wouldn't listen to soccer games, so I never went and did that. But we had an enormous library of games. So just, it was so professional at EA. You went into the library, you checked a game out, you played it, you took it back. And uh, I listened, I played, I used to play games, you know, one, two, three hours a day then. Amazing. All right, I sent a link and um, you only need to watch like a little bit. It's just a song from Normality. Okay, one second. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's fantastic. Okay, let me, uh, let me get back to Discord. Okay, what's your question? Yeah, uh, I believe this is uh, Crackers and Asthma, was it? That's exactly it, yeah. Was this the only song that uh, you did under that band? I did, uh, I think there's three songs I did in that whole game. Everything else is done by Pat and Chris Adams, I think. Pat Phelan and Chris Adams. Well, this one stands out to me because it sounds like there's like real guitars, which is more than you got, uh, got from your synths at the time. Exactly. So the story goes with this. Um, great team of people on this game. Absolutely fantastic. Ricky Martin, Adrian Carlos, who I talked about before, who did the Goalie sample on, on Aichi Osaka. Um, and he was, I think he was the designer on this, along with Ricky Martin, who was a great coder, but he's got, sorry, a great artist, but he's got a great visual art style. So Ricky was the main artist, along with, I think, Chris Russell. Anyway, great team. And um, Aid Carlos was the designer, I believe. But the team just created this beautiful thing. I loved this game. I was a fan of Leisure Suit Larry. This game came along, and then they said, we're going to do a few cutscenes. So this was one. There was one, I think, at the end of the game when he's throwing bottles off of a wall. And they said instead of doing the kind of music that there is in the game, like the orchestral jolly music, we want to have real, a real tune. So I said to Aid, why don't you be the singer then? I'd, I'd can't remember if Normality came before or after Actua Soccer, but because he'd already been in my studio and done a vocal, I said, why don't you come in and sing it? So... I can't remember if I wrote the lyric or if Aid wrote the lyric or we wrote it together, but we, it was definitely a shared thing. So um, that was the vocal was about to happen, but I didn't have a song. So I was in a band at the time in Chesterfield, which is the next city to Sheffield, called the Tuscany Fruit Bats. It was a, a, a really kind of loud, wild, Faith No More type band fantastic fun it was just something to do at weekends i loved it so what i decided to do was get the bass player in to play bass and the guitarist in to play guitar just to play a lick a stab a, just one note just basically so i sat there with a dat recorder basically high quality digital recorder recording both of those guys playing for hours and then the next days, the next, I don't know, it might have taken me a week to write this song. It was, a, it took, it was a real piece of work. I would edit those individual cuts and samples, and I created a song out of them. So I'd, I'd, it wasn't just, t they didn't write the song. They didn't play those notes. They'd play strums or strokes or kerangs or whatever, right? And I would then play with those guitar sounds, chop them up, play with them on the keyboard, and make a song out of it. And then I went in. Uh, I can't remember where I found them, but I've got, it's real drum sounds. Um, instead of a drum machine, it's real drum samples to make it sound real and live, like a proper rock band. And then, so the song was written, just like with Actua Soccer. And then Aid came at the end and he said, uh, we're calling the band Crackers and Asthma. And that's, that's his brain. It's such a great name for a band. Like if you've got asthma, the last thing you want is crackers. It's just this fantastic visual idea of, of crackers and asthma and 
he came in and that's what we decided to call the band. Um, it was him singing and me, me and these two guys, basically, who I don't know if they ever heard the final song and I'm not in touch with them. But they, they were an interesting couple of guys. One of them is a test driver for Toyota. So he, he literally, his job is to speed like a lunatic. And he wears one of those top to bottom uh, white suits with the blue and red stripe down one side. So he's got long hair. He's a rock guitarist like he should be a Metallica. He's a true, he's a legend in his own lunchtime, this guy. Absolute genius. And he just came in and fully rocked out. And then Aid came in and fully rocked out on the vocal. And I just, I put it all together. It, I'm so proud of that song. Well, that's kind of funny one, because uh, from what I gathered, it's the end game band that's called Crackers and Asthma, but it's also like a group of people you just kind of scrounged together there. Yeah, yeah. So it we did, I think, three songs all together I wrote with that team, if you like, with the bass player. That, they didn't write them, like I say, it was just days of sampling. And then right, right. A, I don't think Aid sang on the others. I think that's the only one with vocals on. But I think there were three songs. Yeah, the funny thing is, I'm I'm listed as audio on that game, and of course I've, I wrote three songs on it. But the other people did masses and masses of work on that game, and all I did was those three tracks. Um, like, there's millions of sound effects. I did do some sound effects in there as well. What a great game! Normality is a fantastic, fantastic PC game. It has a it really has that flavor of people like uh, hiding jokes and stuff in it a lot. That's who those people were that made that game. Every single bit of that flavor in that game is descriptive of the people who made it. They're all cool. They're all really great. They're really innovative. And uh, they're all still doing really cool things. Um, yeah. The, I knew it was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be funky. I think there's marijuana plant hidden in there. Um, you know, smashing up the TV. It's basically, it's lawless madness. The kind of stuff you could never make at EA. The kind of stuff you can't make at a corporate monster. But Gremlin was owned by one man, and he was a great bloke. Ian Stewart still is a great bloke. And um, he just enabled everybody. He empowered everybody to do the best they could. And he picked great people, or his team did. And so you got people who were really at the cutting edge. Until Gremlin was um, a bit too big for its boots, it was just majestic. I loved every minute of it. Uh, let's see. There's only one uh, topic left that I wanted to cover, which is kind of jumping way ahead. Um, in 2013, you started uh, Tofino Hi-Fi. Like, what led to that? So, like, why did you decide to start that? Yeah, I'd been I'd been writing music on and off using Reason, uh, Propellerhead Reason, which is a great piece of software. I'd been using that on and off for a while, and just recording those eight bar loops, like I talked about. Of course, they're not all eight bars but recording ideas, but never finishing a song. And then I was talking to Mark Barrett, and he would got his own record label at the time, which was amazing, called International Feel, which was literally the coolest label on the planet for a good year or two years. And all those records are collectible. They were collectible instantly. Beautiful artwork, beautiful music. And he, he was saying to me, you know, you should write some good stuff, so finish some songs, get some stuff released. And he was also connected to all the influencers at the time so all the djs and people like that so he could have got my stuff somewhere if i'd created anything that was ready that was show ready if you know what i mean um and he was giving me great advice he was far in ad advance of me at the time i hadn't written a lot of music and i just thought okay i'm gonna start writing some stuff i needed a name and tofino is a beautiful place on the west coast of of uh, vancouver island a uh, big surf place beautiful place though great beach and uh, I've been to Tofino a while, and I just, I love the name, I, Tofino Hi-Fi anyway, it's just a silly name, but I needed a name that wasn't just my own name. Um, and f I needed an output for these things, so somebody had recommended SoundCloud. Um, and I just thought, okay, I'm going to put these ideas on there. And I started finishing the ideas, instead of them being 30 seconds long or a minute long, I started fleshing them out and making them finished thoughts or finished tracks. And I wrote a song with a vocal I sing on it called Brazil. And, uh, and another one, a uh, disco track, I can't remember the name of it. And those two songs did pretty well online, like in the, um, what were they called? In the torrent sites. Those two songs were shared quite a lot. And I can't remember the name of him now, but there was one guy that used to release a torrent every month 
with 50 unsigned bands and these songs these these each release was just fantastic and he used to get masses and masses of downloads and then eventually he started to he tried to make money out of it and it died but i think i'm on the very first one or the second one of his top 50s um with one of those songs so i just tried to get out there again you know i just tried to get my music out there because i don't have a music outlet so the, being part of the torrent seemed to work great then somebody suggested soundcloud so i thought great there's a name i'm a photographer as well so i did some artwork for it um my photography is under peel photo p-e-e-l-f-o-t-o on instagram so i just decided to do some album covers and just start releasing stuff and so that's when that started and then i took a pause from that about basically what happened was reason stopped working and one release of reason screwed me and so it screwed me for about four years until i built a new computer recently so i built a new desktop bought the new version of reason and i'm away so i've i've written a whole bunch of stuff recently like i said there's two fully finished songs almost ready and then there's about another 20 that that are you know soundcloud almost ready so i'm at it again and i'll probably still use that name because i like it but i've also put my own name on there as well i think so we should be expecting some new soundcloud uploads soon absolutely yeah all right but in addition to that i'm about to start releasing music properly on spotify as well definitely want uh one or two songs on on spotify and all the other streams not that i'll make any money that way but i want to get it out there and in addition to that and here's the the main thing i'm going to release as much of my video game music as possible on all the streaming sites i've been talking to other video game musicians from my era and they were saying forget about the copyright and all that you were the musician you wrote it if anybody has a problem and they want to take back your $75 from Spotify, let them take you to court. Get it all out there. So I'm going to put all my loaded stuff, my reloaded, my whiplash, everything, whatever's available. It's all going to go on, a, on, a, on all the streaming sites. I just need to get the time to do that at the moment. So um, I watched Gregory's Scrolled, and uh, you said you named the album, sort of album, for Tofino Hi-Fi Menzies as like temporarily. Oh, that's great that you noticed that. That makes my day that you noticed that. Yeah. My question is, why? I, I don't see the relation between the character and the album. It's the sound. It's the soundtrack. Oh. So the at the time at the time, um, I was list, I was watching that film and listening to the music. As me and you have discussed the soundtrack to Gregory's Girl, which I think is terrific. We're discussing that at the time, and I I also think. Square Pusher and maybe two or three other people are also fans of that of that movie. It's it, it for me. There's no doubt Square Pusher has an influence there. Um, and at the time, I was strongly influenced by it, and I was playing sounds that way, and and basically being influenced subconsciously by by Gregory's Girl soundtrack. And so when it came to naming a song and name, I, I put together a compilation of music for all my friends and called that Menzies and used a picture of Phil Menzies, who's the teacher from the, from the movie. And he's, he became such an iconic character at the time in England. It was such a... But like briefly, if anybody that knows Gregory's Girls knows Phil Menzies and his moustache that, that never quite grew in. Do you know um, one of the songs in Reloaded is called Quebec? I'd never been to Quebec at all. I'm living in Canada now. But... I'd, I'm, I'd seen something, it must have been a travel show, and I had a feeling, and that feeling somehow came through in the song. And that often happens with song titles for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, same, definitely. It's a feeling, and you're like, where did I get that feeling from? What does that remind me of? Why is that coming to me? Because most of, most of my songs and your songs don't have lyrics, obviously. Right. So you're not taking words from that. You're like, okay, where's this come from? So, like... Square Pusher is a direct influence on that period for me. Um, his drums, his hi hat patterns, his fills, all that kind of stuff was a direct influence. I'm sure I I regurgitated that subconsciously. Um, some of the fast stuff, particularly, um, but I wouldn't like his. The album I was playing to death was Feed Me Weird Things, so I could call a song Weird Things, or you know what I mean. But it'd be too on the nose, too direct. Yeah. This is making me think about how I name my songs, like file name-wise. I think that's a fascinating subject. Didn't you talk about that? Didn't you have a piece about that? 
I had a video about how composers would name their songs in games, or rather, where where the song titles come from. I loved that video. Yeah. There's usually a disconnect between file names and what the fans know the song as, though, because you rarely see the file names. Absolutely true. And also, most I think I've told you this before, but most of the songs that are out there on YouTube of mine, I never named them that. Right, exactly. I don't even, even, even on some places it'll say, this is the official name of this song was actually this. <laughs> I never heard of that word. It's so, it's so funny. And I'm not really precious about it either. I actually enjoy it that they've all got they've all got a life. It's like you had your baby and you sent it out into the world, and they've all taken on a life of their own. And that's what I'm enjoying most about this entire procedure, of this entire process about being being older and having these music these songs out there that are being enjoyed by new people now, and also being renamed, reused. You know, one of the tracks from Loaded was used by a TV show in England, a ghost show. They went looking at haunted houses and leaving a camera on overnight. You know, they, they used it. It was an internet show, but it became successful. I don't know what happened to it since. They didn't pay me a penny, and I didn't care because they weren't making any money at that time. But they were, they were really, you know, they stole my song. And then another one of my songs from Loaded was used in uh, Doomwad. Um, I don't know which one. It's a very famous Doomwad. I tried playing it. It's impossible. If I just watch the video of it, it's crazy. So I love how the, the songs I wrote all those years ago have taken on a life of their own, and they're still being used in different ways, you know? It's mind-blowing. It's kind of an odd case, too, because I can think I can guarantee none of these people are like, I'm going to steal Neil's song. I know. They're just grabbing a song from a video game they like, you know? Exactly that. They don't know who the hell I am. They don't know anything about it. It's just, it's a song that they remember. The only thing that upsets me is there's things out there that's happened and happening that I don't know about. Like my songs are in certain places I've no idea about. Oh yeah, same. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I've made is a, a mashup of three different songs. Yeah. I made it as a joke and just posted it online. It became fairly popular. I think it has like six million views on YouTube now. Holy cow! That's crazy! What I find interesting is uh, a lot of people refer to it as a song from the internet. As if though nobody in particular made it. That's fantastic. That's brilliant. I love that faceless, nameless thing about that's just brilliant. I love how the, the music kind of ascends into like just the ether. It just happens yeah. to be by my hand. It becomes part of the zeitgeist. Yeah, exactly. Once it's left you, it doesn't belong to you anymore. I think it might be that might have been said by other musicians, but the moment it leaves your desk or your recording studio, it no longer belongs to you. It becomes whatever other people... Look at TikTok's usage. Yeah. Little out-of-context snippets from songs are being made, used over and over again in a million different contextual ways. But uh, yeah, I wanted to open up the floor to like, if you wanted to ask me any questions. Wow. I had loads, and I never thought that, to write them all down, but I've had loads as we've been going through this for the last few weeks. I've had loads of them. Um, how did you get into... This is something I was thinking about the other day. How did you start getting into that kind of music that you're into? I didn't even know that genre existed. Uh, which music? Well, like the, you've got the, I don't even know what, what you call it, but like your advert music. It's a bit like Square Pusher, but more Gregory's Girl meets Square Pusher somewhere in there. It's jazz. Yeah, uh, jazz fusion, I guess. Jazz fusion? It's like minimalist, computerized jazz fusion. Yep, that's, that's a good description. Um, yeah, I found a circle of uh, musicians uh, somewhere between 2009 and 2012, uh, and they've just been really into jazz fusion and like uh, making stuff like that. And I Did found you bump it... into them on YouTube or online or something, or local to you? Uh, online. Oh, wow. Wow, I don't even know how you got started on that. Some of the stuff you sent me was amazing. It was like rocket science for music. It was incredible. Yeah, at some point, I'm actually pretty sure it was 2015, I just got super into like complex music, like math rock yeah. and uh, right. prog, zool, whatever else. Yeah, I get that. Cuneiform Records, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it actually, or if you would have heard of it. Yeah, I wouldn't know. No, I haven't. 
Yeah, and I think it's a secret world I've, I've never dug into. I think I might have heard of certain people, but I, I you know, it's a world that I, don't, I really don't know. And I found things like that myself. I found weird little windows downloading torrents years ago, downloading massive torrents of music just to see what was out there, what's happening. Um, there's some really cool, weird shit out there. I like it. And I found a guy called, uh, he's from San Antonio, called Aphelion. Absolutely fantastic musician. And he's just like me and you writing in his, writing in his front room and writing, his, uh, writing in his basement or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, for his own pleasure, f- first and foremost, and connecting to other people. But there used to be a site years ago called mp3.com. I have heard of it. Yeah. So when I was around, when I was at, uh, at EA, so like we're talking about year 2000, he was one of the, it was like SoundCloud and Bandcamp, basically. And everything was free. You just went on there and you downloaded their songs and they didn't mind. It was all cool. Uh, it's a completely free way of sharing your music. And his music was absolutely incredible. And I became a massive fan of his. It was a world of I'd never heard of. It was kind of, I can't even explain it, but it's, it's, a, it's a unique type of techno, electronica, let's just call it that. Um, and he's very talented. He's got great ideas. But he likes heavy, heavy rock. And so it's really unusual to hear somebody that likes that making this. And I was so in love with his music. I played it to death. And it came to making a tennis game for infograms. And I didn't have any kit with me. I was emigrating back to England. My kit was on a ship. So I couldn't write the music. There was nobody else. So I emailed him and said, would you like to do a soundtrack to a video game? He couldn't believe it. So... I got him to do some original stuff and used a couple of my favorite tracks of his. And then the guys who made the game loved it so much that at the start of the game, when the game is loading, they, they uh, animated a beautiful rec, uh, record turntable and the, the arm going onto the disc and making that, that beautiful landing noise, that bass noise when it, when it hits the, the vinyl. And then his song's playing, and then it spins up, and you see his name and is the band's name, and you know the name of the track. Like, what you did that at the beginning of a tennis game? It's got nothing to do with tennis game. But they did it because they loved this guy's music. It was that much of a of a hit on the team. I felt like they might hate me and think I was imposing music that I liked, but they lo- they did this as a surprise to me. I was the producer on that project, so I didn't know it was being made. I didn't know they were doing it, and they were spending time doing this. To show their admiration for it. So imagine being this kid. Imagine this as you. And all of a sudden there's an Xbox game for sale. And your music's all over it. Just fantastic. Future edit here, but I ended up cutting a lot of our conversation because it was a bit all over the place. But uh, there was one particularly interesting thread that I wanted to share here. And that would be talking about some techniques and sources of ideas. What I do, a trick I do, is... I will load in. Back then, I used to anyway. I don't do it any, anymore now. I program every single drum beat, drum beat now, every single drum instrument. But back then, I used to load in five, six, seven, eight drum breaks and cut them all up. So at any one time in Reloaded, you might be hearing a dozen drum breaks, different parts from different pieces, just all edited and thrown in and laid on top of each other sometimes. I found it a really interesting way to get a, a feel really quickly because I didn't have time. And um, not just quickly, but really it had lots of different depths then because all these drum breaks had completely different depth and different feel, different vibe. But as long as I got the timing right, as long as they were all timed to perfection, then, then it worked. So I could just chop up a snare off one beat or a drum. I might even just use a kick drum and a hi-hat and just keep looping that and then load others on top of it. I really enjoyed that multiple layering of breaks. Yeah, the like, uh, sudden shifting of textures is a really fun technique. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you ever listen to the um, song I sent you that I did with um, Ouchie Hour? Oh, that's 
that's really cool. Do you know what it reminds me of? Do you know Pogo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of that. Like how he does those very quick cuts and 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 harsh gates. Because you're really ending your samples. You're chopping them really cho- harsh endings. Yeah, we we're kind of going for that kind of flavor. I love it. More for like the people that inspired Pogo, really. Oh, right. Okay, cool. What is it they say about... Oh, yeah, it's what they say about um, humans and monkeys. Uh, there's no missing link. We, we have a, a series of shared ancestors. And it's the same thing with music. We, there are multiple shared ancestors. So you'll go back to... Square Pusher might go back to Gregory's Girl, but the guy that wrote the soundtrack to Gregory's Girl, whoever it was, I'm damn sure he wasn't the innovator. You know, it rarely is a, a, a movie soundtrack guy that's the innovator he'll have been copying somebody interesting things sound innovative because you don't know what inspired it yeah like absolutely because i don't know anything about like pogo is the root of that for me i know he's sampling and cutting up i know that's been done a million times before but his use of vocal how he plays tunes with vocal samples is definitely the first time and the only time i've heard anybody do that in that way He's so good at it. Yeah, that was inspired by Akufin, which kind of did the same thing, but... Um... Oh, I went and played that. You must have given me that name, because I went and played that. Yeah, I, I gave it to an email, but I thought it might have got lost in the shuffle at some point. No, I went and found that one. And finally, there are two uh, stories that I cut from earlier portions of this video that I still think are worth sharing, so I'm kind of just tacking them on to the end here. First up is a story about just dealing with the limitations of the hardware at the time. I remember being making sound effects for the PC version of Jungle Strike and Desert Strike. I think we did both. Um, that game, by the way, was originally made by EA. So we were doing a ports of that for all the other mach- machines. But the original, I think, was done by EA. And... Um, so I had to make the sound of a helicopter crashing into a bridge. And I must have taken a day. Now, a day in video game development at that time was like a month today. I could write a full song from first kick drum to final release in one full day. And I think I spent a whole day because it was such an important sound. You bumped into things with your helicopter constantly in those games. And I couldn't get the sound in. Everything was crushed so badly by yeah. by the technology, by the by the file size you were allowed, that it was so hard to make a fat. What's what is the sound of a helicopter hitting a bridge? You know, it's a huge metallic sound, and of course a helicopter would blow up. But it wasn't blowing up; it would bang off it. These things. Were, so it's the sound of a helicopter bouncing off a bridge. So you have to use your imagination. And I couldn't get anything. I was so frustrated. And I had a I had a Shure SM57 mic. And I used it for things like I drag the grill of it on the desk. It made a lovely scratchy industrial sound. And I used that for the sound of the helicopter going up and down out of the for the man to jump onto uh, in in the game. I changed it, I played with it in the in the WAV editor, but basically that's where it came from in one of the releases anyway. So I'd been, I'd been playing around with my microphone and I'd done all sorts of things Foley using this mic. And I was trying to get the right sound. So I was banging it on different things around the room. And I just, I had a temper moment and I picked up my microphone and I just threw it behind me. And I never even thought about it at the time, but it's one of my favorite moments in games. It hit this huge metal cabinet behind me where I saved all the copies of the games. And it made this fantastic bang sound. So I recorded this bang sound. It was a perfect sound. <laughs> if you can imagine a microphone hitting a cupboard that's being used as a sound of a helicopter hitting a bridge. But it was. So I then put this sound into the game. I was so proud. I was so excited. I gave it to the coders. They put it into the game. They gave it back to me on the... We had, we had different... Um, we had test versions of Super Nintendo. So I put, played it on my... And they'd absolutely destroyed it. And they made it sound like a baby kicking a toy. (laughs) It was just annihilated. And then 
one of the worst reviews I ever got was for the sound effects in in uh, that game. But they were all destroyed. And they actually mentioned the laughable sound of the of the helicopter hitting the bridge. <laughs> like this is, I love that story. It's one of my most painful memories, but I love it. All right, one last story that I cut from earlier to reintroduce the context. This is when Neil was like still a teenager and trying to break into the recording industry, get signed, that whole process. Um, we decided we were going to go and record a demo tape. So we, we paid for this, this studio called Priority Studios in Sheffield. So we paid for this, this studio. It was a lot of money at the time to us, but we paid, I think, for eight hours to record two songs. We got a book from the library with names of A&R people or names of people at publishing houses some of which were probably gone by then, but we got names because we heard that an address wasn't enough. You can't just send it to Sony and hope for the best. So we sent these off and we got rejection after rejection after rejection. I've still got a load of these rejections because I think every musician keeps their first rejections. Normally, the rejection letters were just a few lines. So they would say, I'm sorry, you're not what we're looking for at this current time. And that was all fine. But then this one letter came and it was an entire page. And it wasn't, it wasn't written by the secretary or the junior or the cleaner. This was written by the A&R guy himself. And he ripped into us, told us exactly why we were shocking, why we'd never make it. And there was such anger and vitriol in, in all of his words. I couldn't believe it. it. It hurt my feelings, but it was also funny. And then I just started to show it to all my friends and say, look at what this guy wrote back. We weren't just rejected. We were rejected with hate. Anyway, I never forget that guy's name. And I, I remember saying to my mom, and moms are really supportive regardless of how talented their kids are. I remember saying this to my mom. She went, look, you meet the same people on the way up as you meet on the way down. So you'll be on the way up one day and you'll meet this guy coming the, coming the other way. And that stuck with me for the rest of my life, her saying that about this guy. And then this, this letter stayed with me. And this is another time that my life comes around in full circle. This letter was from a guy called Simon Cowell. Oh. At the time, he was an A&R guy, but he was doing exactly what he does on TV, but he was doing it for a living as an A&R guy. I can't remember which label it was for, Chrysalis. I can't remember now anyway. So I've got this rejection letter for Simon Cowell. Come, come... How many years would it be now? Uh, 15 years later, I hired Simon Cowell to work on American Idol, the video game. And I wrote the dialogue for him and Paula Abdul and Randy Jackson. And there I am in a hotel recording dialogue with Simon Cowell in, in Santa Monica. He comes into the room, we have a chat, we, you know, we settle down, what do you do, what do you do, what's your background, all this stuff. And we, we do some recording for half a day. And all the time, I couldn't wait to show him this letter, just thinking, I can't wait, can't wait to show him this letter. He won't believe that somebody saved it and we've got this connection, you know. So, so I showed it to him. I said, you're not going to believe this, but read this letter. And he read it and he's giggling to himself and he went, well, was I right? I never even thought about it. He went, well, yeah, I went. He went, well, fuck you then. <laughs> It was just this, this absolute beautiful moment. And it was, we all had a good laugh about it. And it was a great, it was another one of those things coming full circle, which makes your life sometimes feel like it's a movie when these weird moments happen. Um, After the reprise. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was unbelievable. And so we, we then had a connection and we, you know, it was a, a really good relationship with him as it, as it was with Paula Abdul and Randy Jackson. But that, it was a cool... These things, you, you know, a guy from a village on the outskirts of Sheffield, you don't think you're ever going to be anything. You don't think you're ever going to be mixing with anybody, let alone with Paula Abdul in her house in Hollywood. It was all these things kept happening that were just surreal. And that's all for this video. Thanks for watching or listening, as it were. Usual stuff here at the end of the video. Subscribe, uh, support, watch more of my stuff. Whatever the case, thanks for watching.